I couldn't help but think that this was Free Willy for adults. Ooh. <laughs> I have not seen the movie. And I'm gonna I'm ready to go on record as saying that's on point. <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined as always by the voice of CinemaSins, Jeremy Scott. Yoink. Yoink. <laughs> that, with, that yoink is owned by Disney now. Yoink. Know, <laughs> sucks. That's one of my favorite <laughs> Simpsons moments ever. It's where like, the diamond tooth is showing and it sparkles and this guy out of nowhere just goes, yoink. <laughs> <laughs> they use yoink a few times. Yeah, the yeah they do. And for music video sends Barrett Share. Happy 2018. Yay. Ha- 2000. We're saying, well, happy 2018 from 2017. <laughs> We're, yeah, we traveled <laughs> into the future. Indeed. That's right, to welcome you into the new year. <laughs> um, today, we're going to start a format that I think was sort of gestating when we first began this podcast, mm-hmm. because we weren't quite sure where we were going to go with it. And then, you know, then we had brackets, and, uh, you know, we started talking, about, we started making what's the best out of that, what's the best year, what's the best bracket, yeah. but all that, it's just a million things we started doing. <laughs> Now we're back to this at this point. We're going to try this out. We're going to try a structured thing, mm-hmm. and we're going to get into a lot of topics today. We're going to get into news. We're going to get into rants. We're going to get into a lot of things, like, you know, the just general movie topics. Yeah! That's right, baby. Woohoo! Well, and part of it is we're just caving, because this is what most good podcasts do. Like, before <laughs> we ever even had a podcast, we saw Kevin Smith tape live for his Hollywood Babylon in L.A., and he had all these, like, segments and intros and whatnot it's kind of like when john oliver says and now this yeah every single episode uh, so we're going to try some structured stuff that will allow us to to rant a little bit to talk about m- brand new news movie news things we've seen that we like make some recommendations answer questions it's gonna be fun yeah baby and you know if this doesn't work after a few times we'll try something else we're yeah. not gonna stop we're not yeah. gonna fucking stop <laughs> we can't stop i would say we'll though stop. i would say though that if you have been with us for the past two years you're going to enjoy the structure of this mm-hmm. uh because we'll still be the same podcast but we're just a little bit more structured yeah so. plus we'll barrett try- gets to make a bunch of new cool audio montages to yeah. intro each segment mm-hmm. that'll fun. be fun for you that's right it might be a lot of work but it'll be fun <laughs> So, are we going to, we're going to start off with a rant from yeah, let's everybody? Do it. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! I'm as mad as hell! You've never seen me very upset. Lord Jesus! Lord Jesus! Well, I, the first thing that comes to mind is like the last thing I put on my list, but I want to rant about the fucking Tennessee liquor laws. Because <laughs> mm, mm. we live in the Bible Belt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> movie topic one yeah <laughs> i'm sorry it's not the rants are are open to any topic like it, the reason we even kind of conceived the rant structure as an opening was when chris ranted about that apple commercial that was so pretentious the other day <laughs> yeah. um and I, and I think that sort of opened it whatever's on your mind you hear a song that's really annoying you lately <laughs> okay i want to talk about the tennessee liquor laws because what's a computer what what's a computer yeah. there you go <laughs> what is a computer i just got this ipad dongle <laughs> um <clears throat> so in tennessee because we're a backwards fucking state you can't buy liquor that means wine and alcohol hard liquor you can buy beer you can't buy liquor on sunday right you can't even buy beer on sunday until it's past noon it's <laughs> crazy which th- th- this is the era we live in right that's just stupid that's bad enough mm-hmm Okay, even when I know this, heading into Christmas weekend, I'm like, well, Christmas Eve is Sunday. Right. So I better buy wine in advance if I want any wine on Sunday because it's a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Tennessee won't let you have wine on Sunday. Monday, Christmas Day being a holiday, can't buy wine. (laughs) Tennessee has set aside a handful of holidays. Most of them are your typical you know, national holidays off work or whatever. Can't mm. buy can't buy wine on like Fourth of July. Oh, really? Can't buy wine on Christmas Day. Can't buy wine on New Year's Day. Ah, wow. Um, That's and counterintuitive. I, I want to know why. <laughs> yeah, who who's nobody benefits from this, right? Right. Like, you don't think the liquor stores want to make a day's extra 
we're, this is not like a Chick-fil-A situation where the liquor stores are just like, well, for God reasons, we're going to stay closed because <laughs> the community likes God. <laughs> you realize God how many reasons. thousands of dollars they're leaving on the table by not selling more wine? What's and, crazy is that you can't get wine on New Year's Eve this year. Yeah, New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. You got to yeah. plan ahead, folks. Oh, you can't that. get your vodka. You're, you're screwed. You're screwed. Used to be you couldn't get wine in grocery stores. Yeah, that, that only happened law. a year and a half it was ago. About a year, yeah. The uh, the yeah that is the uh, the dumbest thing, and I've I've heard this from people who have moved to the state. Yeah, uh, that this is stupid, and it is stupid because what are they? Do they think that they're preventing people from drinking on Sunday? Yeah, because you can go out to a bar and get fucking hammered yeah mm-hmm. holy shit you and can you can buy bar. beer right and get hammered yeah not but only afternoon yeah yes. not this, during church time this sounds like a law that has been on the books since like 1906 exactly and they just sort of like no one has ever like come to challenge it right for some reason maybe you should challenge it jeremy maybe, maybe i should because i don't see like the only resistance would have to be the hard religious right right yep and they don't drink anyway. <laughs> well, not in public. <laughs> well, not, yeah. Well, it, but like there, that's that should be the only opposition. Mm-hmm. Every liquor store, every grocery store, every company that owns any liquor store or grocery store should be behind that. Yeah. Let's open up a whole other day. It feels and, like the, every time that 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 law comes up, somebody goes, "Oh, it's probably because we're in the Bible Belt," and they never fight it. But right, why don't? Why don't we start it now? <laughs> mm. Maybe there's maybe uh, there can't be that many people in this in the mid state now that are like that. Oh, yeah, that's a totally great law. Really? I don't. I mean, yeah, I think even the even the really churchy people that I know in my life, I don't think would object to. No, man. Like a month ago, I, I forgot to buy wine in advance of a Sunday and I wanted to have a little bit of something before I went to bed because I am an insomniac. Um, so I'm out and about getting my Starbucks. It's like 1045. I swing by the gas station. I try and buy one tall 24 ounce can of apple cider beer. Uh-huh. And I walk to the counter and the guy's like, I can't sell to you. Oh. And I was like, what? He's like, it's Sunday. And I'm thinking, I know I've bought beer on Sunday before. He's like, only afternoon. Uh. Like, Son of a bitch. <laughs> All these stupid fucking laws. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway. Let Jeremy and drink. Like, and like you're a narc that's going in trying to buy <laughs> yeah, 24 seriously. ounce beer before noon. Yeah. You know, like hey, we got to crack down on it. Like, can you just ring it up in an hour? I'll give you the cash. Just ring it up later. Yeah. Nobody has to be wiser. Exactly. Come on. That's my rant. It's like, you know, you get on the news and it's like, you see the, ca- the the clerk behind the counter takes the money for the drink, but then doesn't punch it up until an hour later. <laughs> this is something in the community we need to stop, god damn it. Yeah, the scourge. Yep. Um, okay, so it is uh, it is December in Nashville, which means that it's December everywhere, actually. <laughs> 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 good point but what i mean by nashville is that it uh, it comes a time at this point of the year where all those movies that you've been hearing about for months finally come out yes mm. and then you get some in january like the post and all that is coming out in january and everything meanwhile you fuckos in New York and Los Angeles get to watch this shit because you're in these big cities and because, yeah. you know, they know that they can make money with just about anything when they drop a, a movie that you've heard about. But the thing is, I understand why they did limited releases back in the day, because you had to build a word of mouth. You had to get all this type of thing, sort of a momentum going when you uh when you came out with these movies and that way word of mouth came and finally when december hit people in nashville and people in peoria and people in like you know uh, wichita (laughs) knew to go to see those movies because there was all this talk about it and everything and they would do things like it'd be in la and new york and then it would go to chicago and then like atlanta and houston and all these places that just sort of like gradually build up a, a thing but now it's getting to the point where it's just getting ridiculous where like all these movies I want to see come out on the same day, same week, within two weeks of each other yeah. a lot of times. And I'm sitting there like trying to plot out when I'm going to watch these movies and it's nearly impossible. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. In, and, and then if they happen to not hit with audiences, they're not going to be around very long. Right. So It makes no sense. It makes no sense. I know it's award season. I know that's why... 
you know, the the the, the couture movies are coming out mm-hmm. uh, at, at this point. And actually, I think we this came up when we talked to Jesse Malton about it. But like all the screeners are going out and everything is going like right at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we literally just talked about how much we loved Get Out and how it's like at the top of our list came out in fucking February. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not necessary to wait for this. I mean, maybe there's a chance that the Academy forgets all about Get Out. I don't think that's going to happen this year. But like, well, it's spread it out. It's kind of a myth because Silence of the Lambs came out in February. Mm -hmm. One Best Picture. Uh, there's, I mean, there's some movies that you could say maybe got screwed because of coming out in early in the year, like Wonder Boys came out in February. Of that mm. year. I mean, it's, it, it's still though, if you're good and you're like something that's been talked about or whatever, you're going to hit the end of the year pretty well, you know, represented yeah. and everything. And you can always use these months that have all the trash, like September or January and all that. Well, not January, but se- right. do September and maybe some, sometimes October you get these, you know, Oscar hopefuls that come out and everything. But try to come out with a little bit more. Stagger them a little yeah. bit, man. Just make so I can have a chance. Yeah. Like now it's – and it did this last year too where it seemed like every day that I had a chance. I was like I was going out yeah. and getting to a movie and everything. I was like I don't I, – I mean this is because it's my life. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't do this normally. Yeah. You went to like three different theaters in a day last year, didn't you? Yeah, I went all over. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just one of those. Let me ask you this: Is the Shape of Water playing anywhere around here? Yes, it is. It's playing at Belcourt. I actually saw this. Is Belcourt it good? Belcourt and uh, Opry Mills had it too. Um, it's funny that this movie's brought up because I was at one point. There's a segment that's coming up later in this thing. I was thinking about putting it there, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm I can't put it in either one. Um, Interesting uh shape of water is good it's one of guillermo del toro's probably one of his better movies hmm. i couldn't help but think that this was free willy for adults Ooh. <laughs> i have not seen the movie and i'm gonna i'm ready to go on record as saying that's on point in I, multiple ways from what i understand yes, <laughs> extremely <laughs> I was I was about to say it's it, it, it every sense of the term free willy. <laughs> By now it should be no. I mean you everybody knows Sally Hawkins is going to fuck this thing, yes, right? Yes. Yes. I think it's pretty clear from the trailer. It's pretty clear from the trailer that he's she's going to fuck the thing. Yeah, <laughs> the fish guy. <laughs> and I never I, I don't know if that's believable. Mm-hmm. I, I I I can see the friendship and everything. I just can't I can't I kn- the whole movie is like, you know, shows that she's got this like routine in the morning where she masturbates and then like, you know, goes to work and all that. It's mm. done, done like in a, me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's done in a very Darren Aronofsky sort of way where it's like, you know, it, it cuts to all the different little things that she after they show the long version. Uh-huh. Of it, the next time the next day comes up, it's uh-huh. like, you know, like yeah, that. Yeah. And uh, so like, so, yeah, I watched this and I was like, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. <laughs> but i don't know if that's believable uh this seems like free willy for adults <laughs> does it have a shot of him like arcing over her at the end? uh no but he i mean i won't i won't <laughs> sorry i won't uh, is there a michael jackson song there is not a michael year? jackson song holy shit that'd be amazing <laughs> oh, me. you are not alone <laughs> um yeah i I, it's it's you know it's one of those movies it's it's very visually uh well put together performances are good but the story for me is like i've seen this before i know Mm -hmm. it looks good it looks different looks different Mm -hmm. it's not really it's not really different yeah and so again i guess i'm i hate being down on guillermo del toro i want to like everything he comes out with and I liked this. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say. I mean, it's kind of like Hellboy. Like, oh, I like that. Right. That's about where it ends. <laughs> yeah, and you exactly. know what? That's the other thing about this is that is that Hellboy has elements of this too. This yeah. movie. Yeah. Because of the fish guy that's in that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I immediately thought Hellboy or whatever. When I did you see the review that absolutely trashed the movie and mm-hmm. director Benicio del Toro? No. <laughs> oh come on! I didn't <laughs> see that. <laughs> yeah, Guillermo del Toro uh, posted about it and said, um, you know, just once I'd like to have a review like this about one of my movies, but Benicio will have to take. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's oh pretty God. awesome. Wow. Um, <laughs> no, I totally agree with you about the uh, the, the the chunking. Yeah, getting the back chunking. To- yeah, getting getting back to the, the actual Sorry. yeah the no that's fine I, I I wanted to talk about Shape of Water somehow and I'm glad I got a chance Good. to um but yeah we're we're at a point now where we are aware of the movies that we need to see right. before they come out it's not a word of mouth thing anymore no even in Podunk Nashville and Podunk Peoria and po- Podunk Des Moines. Places where you can't get booze on Sundays. Right, exactly. <laughs> Even these places. Like, maybe that's it. Maybe, like, if, once you uh, pass more progressive liquor law legis- legislation, <laughs> we'll give you the movies. It'll open up the floodgates. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I was watching Live, uh, Live by Night the other day uh-huh. at Ben Affleck. First of all, once I finally got around to seeing that, I don't think it's as bad as the reviews were. Hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie. Which one was this? Uh, Live by Night, the Ben Affleck. Oh no, I didn't see that. Rum running period piece, mm. but it's set during Prohibition. And I'm watch every time I watch parts of this movie, I'm like, you know, just like some part of this just stuck with Tennessee on Sundays all the way through to modern day. Because <laughs> like, there's so many conversations in this movie where. He's talking to somebody like, well, once they end prohibition, such and such will happen. Uh, and somebody's like, they'll never end prohibition. And the country doesn't um, trust its citizens, yada, yada. And Ben Affleck's like, country's in the tank and they need to end prohibition. That's the only option to blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my, my whole point is that era of thinking is still alive on Sundays in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Motherfucking <laughs> bastard. Sorry, yeah. I stole your rant to go back to my rant. That was an excellent Ben Affleck impersonation. By the way. That was terrible. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> But there are moments in that movie that work really well. It's yeah. just not cohesive as a whole. It's anyway. so odd because he's he's usually you know on top of that stuff. It's just uh, it's just a little meandery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just a little. I think you know that happens to a lot of people in their fourth or fifth movie if they've done three awesome ones. Yeah. They're just like, well, maybe I don't have any bad ideas. They actually come up <laughs> later in my conversation about uh, a, a director that I've been obsessed with lately. My rant is associated with the next segment too because I went to the Hollywood Reporter website. Oh, boy. And this actually happened to us on a recent podcast when I went to the Grammys website. Mm -hmm. The fucking autoplay video on the websites. I went to look at the Hollywood Reporter to see a list, and I'm scrolling through the list, and all of a sudden I hear... Here's our top 25. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where the fuck is that coming from? Yeah. And then I go up and I finally find the video and I hit pause and then I scroll down. That motherfucker follows me down on the bottom right yeah. of the screen. Yeah. It's still fucking There's going. One of these sites, it may not be the Hollywood Reporter, but one of these sites that does Hollywood news, one of the four or five big ones, that I can't ever fucking find the video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, there's and like the three audio or four won't shut. And I've got a little speaker icon on my tab <laughs> in Chrome and Firefox. That fucking never works. Yeah. <laughs> I click that shit, it doesn't turn off the sound. Hell yeah. no. Now, this is a good rant topic. <laughs> oh, that's man. Some, I thought you were going to go into like all the uh, award season like banner ads oh for your that, consideration yeah because that, yeah, yeah. that shit gets really annoying like i fucking hate going to imdb and they've like put a skin on yeah. for <laughs> the new liam neeson movie yeah. or whatever the fuck i'm just like just i do why want information i don't give a fuck who i should consider i'm not a voter i know who are they trying to that's a broad reach right well, there a, not that industry people don't read the hollywood reporter right but they're still numbering in the hundreds yeah right send, and the hollywood the reporter to be a successful website probably has to have millions of readers mm-hmm. most of the people reading are people like you and me right. people who are passionate about film who want to see the latest news and how much are they paying for those ads i don't know man they used to in chicago they may have done this in new york too uh over the holidays sometimes they would wrap an entire subway train yeah in like a jack daniels ad oh yeah <laughs> and i'd be like what the fuck like <laughs> everywhere you look there's a bottle of jack Dan- on the outside and on the inside of the car yeah they like I, I, i'm aware, I'm aware. Gotta, <laughs> jack daniels. yeah they've got to be spending some <laughs> some serious bucks to get a whole car filled with it like yeah. i remember when uh what was that uh that the tutors came out that, oh like, yeah 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 they they just lined that shit up <laughs> with the tutors everywhere in the car <laughs> <laughs> like it was not only on the ones at the top of the train it was also on the ones that are the little placards next to the doors and wow. everything so like everywhere you looked was the fucking tutors yeah you know 
And I still didn't watch that show. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I've got no time for it. I, and when we were looking up the, the Grammy nominees, uh, when they were released a couple of weeks ago, we all had our headphones on to pull up the website, and all of a sudden, fucking somebody comes on like, here's our Grammy nomination. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, like, everybody's like, ah! Yeah. So, fuck this, man. End this. There's no reason for it. I understand widgets. I understand, like, little, you know, fragment, uh, you get some sort of revenue out of it, but just fucking stop it. I don't yeah. understand. I mean, we have to reach a point at some point where advertisers are going to realize you're actually making people angry when you mm-hmm. buy an ad that does not allow them to mute it or stop it. Right. Right? Like, let's just say it was Jack Daniels. Sorry, Jack Daniels. <laughs> I, um, that's Tennessee made, right? Yep. yep. All right. So let's trash something from in-state. Uh, can't buy your shit on Sunday anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> can't buy their shit in the place that they make it. That's so right. So let's say I go to a website, Hollywood Reporter, some autoplay Jack Daniels ad starts up. If I can't mute that shit or shut it off, I'm going to buy Jim Beam the next <laughs> five years of my life anytime I need whiskey. <laughs> exactly. Like, Jack Daniels has just pissed me off. Yep. And at some point, they're going to realize that's why I think the YouTube like skippable ads are probably the best option for both content creators and viewers. Because if you're a viewer, if you're passionate about the creator, you can choose to watch and know that it's helping them earn. You can skip and know they probably earned a couple pennies, what have you. Um, but you're still aware. That's the brilliance of the pre-roll ads is that you're aware, you can tune out, you can skip, whatever. But it, it does have some sort of... You know, recognition, even but but not annoyance. It didn't stay with you the entire. Well, and of even the there. even the the high end YouTube ads that that won't let you skip them are typically, at least for me as some as a viewer, are typically fifteen to twenty seconds. Yeah, they're yeah. not like three and a half minutes of I don't know, some cancer drug. Well, the the interesting thing is they've been doing a lot of downsizing, like the movie downsizing, mm-hmm. and they've got a clever ad campaign where like Matt Damon will come on and be like, "Hey, I've only got five seconds to talk about downsizing," and then oh shit, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. they, they <laughs> can play like with a, it and have right. fun. Yeah, that's. By the way, I'm really conflicted about that movie. I haven't seen it, obviously, but you know, Dyster was like. There are lots of things to enjoy, but it was kind of disappointing. And then a couple of days ago, I saw Leonard Moulton tweet his review, and it's like basically his favorite movie of the whole year. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I'm like, wow, this one seems kind of divisive, and mm. I wonder which way I'll go. I yeah. don't know. I can't wait to see it, though. Yeah, me It'd too. be interesting. It, Alexander Payne, I'm, baby. I'm excited to watch it. I think our first, uh, first round of rants went pretty well. Pretty good stuff. I man. think so. I think so. Matter of fact, uh, do we want to go into our second thing? Because I can start that off. It's related to this thing. Let's do it. So we're going to talk about the news of the day. News on the mark! Instead of one big shot controlling all the media, now there's a thousand freaks Xeroxing their worthless opinions. Uh, we're going to talk about kind of what's been going on uh, this week, um, usually related to, to movie stuff. So the reason that I was on the Hollywood Reporter website was because they published their 10 least favorite movies of the mm. year, or the 10 worst movies of the year, according to the Hollywood Reporter. And I found this very interesting because I've seen probably th- four of them or so, uh, but the other ones I just totally kind of expected, except for one. Okay. okay? So I'm going to run down the list really, really quick. All right. Number 10 is the Reese Witherspoon vehicle Home Again. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Which is probably Sweet Home Alabama that all fucking trailer over pretty again. much told you everything you needed to know, and then that is you didn't need to see it. I didn't see Big Little Lies, but I understand that was pretty, that was really good, right? It was, it, it was good. It, it was had good. its moments, yeah. yeah. Uh, but Reese Witherspoon always makes these weird decisions where it's like she'll be in something great, uh, like even Wild. Did you ever see Wild? Yep. That was an interesting Loved choice Wild. and everything. But. Then she'll do fucking home again. So I don't know. Anyway, so that's number 10. Number nine is Queen of the Desert and Nicole Kidman, uh, uh, Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog, yeah. Movie that I had very little awareness of, yeah. but apparently it completely missed the mark. So number eight is one we discussed last uh, week was Baywatch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is such weird. Exactly what they said about it, too, which is like they were trying to do a lot of like raunchy humor and it doesn't. It doesn't get there, It doesn't right? get there. And yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a lot of times you're just sitting there going, oh, he got his dick stuck in a thing. <laughs> okay, great. That's fantastic. <laughs> please, Boom. please get his dick out. <laughs> uh, th- number seven is Miley's favorite movie of the year, Justice League. I'm glad I thought to you see were about this. to say Miley's. I didn't do. People in Miley Cyrus's Miley's work. Miley's favorite movie of the year. <laughs> I like the stuff that Miley did this year. But uh, yeah, Justice League is number seven. Um gets everything that it deserves i know it made a 
sizable amount of money, but yeah. it was still disappointing. Left money on the table. It's fucking horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, number six was the, the the only big surprise on here was the snowman. Yeah, um, oh, well, this, though. it's it's yeah. actually not a surprise anymore. It was right. if you if we were to you know in August be able to see four months in advance or whatever, then we'd be like, whoa, really? Yeah, yeah, because it looked good. Yeah, 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 it was very weird. I mean, Fassbender typically makes really good decisions. Apparently, people love the book. Uh, the marketing strategy was inane, uh, and it is apparently a terrible movie, too. Number five is a movie that we've all seen and hated, The Mummy. Mm-hmm. Ah, fuck mm-hmm. that movie. Mm-hmm. Fuck that movie, right? Fuck the that movie, movie that brought hard. down an entire plan. The, yeah. The movie that proves you can be one of the worst movies of the year simply by being bland. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. It's not like The Room or Birdemic bad. <laughs> it's not like there are ter- there's terrible acting performances. You're like, oh, that's awful. It's a track. <laughs> it's just every single decision they made was just below average. Right. Every and, single one. And Tom Cruise is just sleepwalking through mm-hmm. the whole fucking thing. Well, sleep running. Uh, mm-hmm. no, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Number four is a movie that I will refuse to see. Oh. Geostorm. Oh, oh yeah. well, what if we have to sin it? You just going to pass oh. it off? I'm looking yeah. forward to sending it because then I can make a bunch of Into the Storm outtakes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's it's Dean Devlin, basically a Roland Emmerich disciple. And well, that's his partner. Why don't they go fuck with another planet for once? Yeah. I'm yeah. sick of seeing the same old shit. Fucking Geostorm. Uh, everything about that is offensive to me. Number three is the Book of Henry and Naomi Watts. Um, kind of weird... Yep. tonally off Colin Trevorrow thing. yeah Colin, Colin Trevorrow. Trevorrow yeah that's right yeah. and one of the most panned movies of the year uh, yeah. number two is Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets I'm surprised that made this this deeply into a worst list actually because uh, a movie like Valerian I haven't seen it mm. but just by hearing what other people were saying about it it sounded like it was just you know it just wasn't good and, yeah yeah whatever we'll move on but i guess they're saying it's it's aggressively bad yeah yes um I, I don't get that movie i didn't get it from the trailer i didn't get it from the rihanna stunt casting i didn't get any part of that movie number one number one is a movie that none of us have seen but we all know very well 9 11 oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah the only time i'll laugh about 9 11 mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah but, uh, something about Russian sugar daddies. I something remember. Something about Russian sugar daddies. <laughs> Charlie Sheen. Oh my God! Everything about this movie looks awful. Oh, so yeah. anyway, that's that's my news thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I, I I don't really uh you know actually pay much attention to the news that's going on because I try to keep myself insulated from any kind of talk about movies mm. and stuff like that. But I ran across one on Dark Horizons. It was pretty pretty fun, and I don't I don't think it was their original thing. Apparently, this thing was going around social media for a while. But the question was asked, "What would get you back into cinemas?" Hmm. Um. Obviously, I mean, like, so I I was looking at the uh, the numbers. I think in the Dark Horizons article, they they mentioned this too. Uh, this year, movie industry made somewhere a little bit over eleven billion dollars. They're not hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just slightly below what last year did. Um, I think slightly below means something in excess of two hundred million dollars or two. It might be more than that, but still, I mean, relatively, nobody's not. really hurting. Yeah, yeah. Here, um, but uh, I guess there is this this thought that there are people out there, and it's a sizable chunk of people who aren't going because it's because of something at the movie theater and i agree that there's probably a few people out there who are like my home theater's better or they think that uh that you know nothing's ever going to be done about these phones that are just constantly yeah. you know i mean the other day i was sitting right next to somebody who just pulled out his phone <laughs> sat there and, and um but i was surprised in the dark horizons thing that the top two things that they were that people were concerned about one was not a surprise. Cheaper tickets. Mm. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second one was better presentation, which I, ha- having worked at movie theaters as long as I have, like I, I made mention of this uh, a few episodes ago, I remember showing stuff before that it wasn't the greatest like the you know we didn't have a, a lamp to change out in the lamp house and mm. the, the image was a little bit dark. But man, I saw so many different things that just went by and no one ever complained about it. And it could be just that people were just like, 
I don't want to. I don't want to get up and talk about this. But right. They, but they never came out later and said anything about it. None of that. I always got the impression that there were just a very few people in this on this earth that really notice anything going on when they're watching a movie. Mm. Like, I, and I've been in movies where I'm like, hey, I'll go to the, I'll be with somebody and I'll be like, you notice that? And they're like, uh, I don't get it. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't understand. I don't see it. And I'm like, no, seriously, there's like green scratches when we don't see scratches anymore. But right. there's like green scratches over there on the right side. No, I don't see it. <laughs> and uh, and so like, I, I was kind of surprised that was one of the, the top answers or whatever. That brings up a weird memory because two of the movies that Chris, you and I saw together this year, War for the Planet of the Apes was super dark. Even mm-hmm. though that's a super dark movie, this was a brand new theater yep. and it was super super dark yeah the 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 war of the planet of the apes which you know which i then later saw on blu-ray and i was like holy shit it's like so much (laughs) different (laughs) um the yeah there's a there is an issue with uh with people who work in theaters nowadays i'm i'm i get the idea i get the sense that most people now especially the ones who are getting hired in the last several years have no projection experience right uh, people who did have projection experience have gone like I have. Mm. Um, and they, they all have YouTube channels. They yeah. all have YouTube channels. <laughs> I think that, uh, I think that though, that there's just, there's just not enough people who really know, they know things, they know like how to fix certain things here and there, but they're not diagnostic, you know, people, they don't go to a, a you know, I think if they're the first couple of things don't work, they're like, they're giving up mm-hmm. well and they started down this path when you and i were working there when they moved away from union projectionists who largely were passionate about the craft um and started going to manager operators mm-hmm. they called them and it's only because you and i took an interest in it and were passionate about it that you and i became good projectionists but mm-hmm. the large majority of managers we worked with who they were just threaders threaders yeah. and starters no, they didn't they give a shit about terrible. presentation and, and so this has been coming for a while. Now you've removed even the manager operators that cared, mm-hmm. and you're probably just sending ushers up. I mean, you probably don't have to send anybody anymore, right? Doesn't mm. a computer start the movie? I mean, yeah. Most of the, I mean, if a movie doesn't start on time these days, then yeah, something is is really wrong. Yeah. But like, um, but like, yeah. I mean, if if there is something upstairs that they actually need to do, I wonder how many people have hands on experience with those projectors. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody on Facebook sent me a thing where the, I guess on the opening night of star Wars, uh, they didn't hear the dialogue for the first six to eight minutes or something oh, really? like that. And I went through a whole long scenario of like how many different things that could be, mm. but still they didn't restart it or anything for those people. Oh, they just, really? just fixed the problem eight minutes in and just said, here, enjoy it. Fuck Meanwhile, that. someone like me who has dealt with all this stuff before would have been like, oh, they missed the eight minutes. First off, if that, there was one question that didn't have, it didn't get answered out of all this article that was written about it was, was it like that during the trailers? Mm-hmm. Were, were people sitting there watching that and just assuming the movie would be fine and never came out and complained during that whole time? Because that's on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't complain for 20 minutes while trailers went on without dialogue and then eight minutes into the movie, you finally came out and said something. That's on you guys. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Well, that's that's the, the second issue that happened to us this year was the first time that we saw Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. The the sound mix was, in my opinion, oh, pretty was, fucking low. It was, it was messed up. And nobody got up to, to say anything. Yeah, including and, me. And thinking about it, like the trailers were pretty low too, but I, like John Q. Public, was thinking, oh, well, they'll probably fix it for the movie. I no. get into these situations where I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm almost, I've almost given up on, I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't, but I've almost given up on like people doing stuff for me when right. I'm at a movie theater, you <laughs> yeah. know, like go out and especially that theater we were at yeah, where yeah. it's kind of, I don't know, it's a new theater, but it doesn't seem like they got all the, usually a new theater has got all the best and brightest. Right. They've been like <laughs> trained like crazy to open this theater and as you open you know it's like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some people who didn't get the memo on all that but i i do i do think that's a, an issue that there's just not enough people have the hands on and that's the reason why the presentation is bad 
I think I think the the reason people aren't going is more is is easier to look at. There's so much more to do nowadays than there was back in the uh, like all the problems that you're talking about have existed for years. Yep. And I know that there you know union projectionists were probably more solid in 70s and 80s and everything. So you did get people who cared more and everything, but you went into them. I went in. I remember watching Twins when I was eleven. <laughs> uh, there was like a whole section of the movie that got cut out because of probably like a brain wrap or something. <laughs> I didn't know what it was at the time. <laughs> was Danny DeVito was like jumping around because you know the scene where he's like talking to the dude about how much he's gonna he's gonna get for this like uh, airplane part, whatever the fuck uh, he's selling. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he, he's like, I was, you know, was, I was thinking something like 10 or whatever. And he's thinking 10,000 right. in his head. Yeah. And the guy's like, if you think you can do better than $10 million, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then Danny DeVito's like, Oh, 10 million. I didn't know we were going figures that high. And he starts jumping around $10 million and all that or whatever. Yeah. He was on the couch or whatever. And then it's like, it's like. <laughs> jumped like all the way over into the other part of the screen oh yeah like instantly or whatever <laughs> and who knows union projectionists in tennessee there may not have been any for all for yeah, all I, I know but um i i feel like even in the you know, like even in the 80s and you know 70s and stuff you're probably seeing this type of stuff it's always been there but just now you have video games you have youtube you have so many if you have tv that has all sorts of shows and movies on it there's there's so much convenience now whereas back in the 70s and 80s you didn't i mean you, v, the vcr came in around that time mm -hmm. and you i mean you got movies but it wasn't like oh this is cinematic quality or anything yeah. it took until the 90s for even to get dvds yeah i mean it, it's it's really just i mean I, I just think there's just too many options now and that's the reason why everything has gotten eaten into. music's been eaten into mm -hmm. i mean it's not that sports has, that has nothing to do with the the i guess the quality of music i wouldn't think mm -hmm. i mean every i mean we think there's some shit that's stupid out there but well yeah i mean Al, that's been the the argument over the last since the 1970s people have said rock and roll is dead and people are saying it now because on popular radio you very rarely ever hear any rock and roll there's excellent rock and roll out there but you have to look for it it's mm -hmm. just not in the mainstream everything that you look at has it has a lower audience than it used to tv used to have 60 something million viewers for something like the finale of mash right now like something like you know what what was the i guess big bang theory was the is the number one show right now mm -hmm. something like that it's not it's not much whatever it's not nearly what it was back then it's all because they're so it's segmented now there's so much that you have to grade success on a different scale yeah and uh and i i, I get a little defensive about when people start talking about movies are dead and movies yeah. you know you can't go to you can't go to theaters anymore and all that all this shit it's the same as it was back in the day right. where we just got more shit to do <laughs> <laughs> well if you think about it when we were growing up um you know early 80s there there wasn't any of that shit you just rattled off there was not only a not, not youtube there was no internet yeah so we didn't have a vcr at first you know but basically my brother's life and mine w consisted of you know setting up army men and shooting marbles at them or going outside and playing wiffle ball um or chew the bark off trees mm. that's an old <laughs> snl reference <laughs> did you ever see uh well it's, it's a dana carvey character uh, uh angry oh old it's man. A, yeah back in my day yeah in yeah. my day we didn't have any fancy video games we had to make up our own games like chew the bark off trees <laughs> <laughs> and we um, liked it you know if you were gonna not my family because we didn't do the theater but if you were gonna go out and do something big for fun you know, you had a couple options. You mm -hmm. go, you know, you go to the movies or go to the lake. Jerk off. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it morning? Mm -hmm. um, yep. But now I think you're right. There are so many more options, not only just for media, but just for fun. Mm -hmm. Like Top Golf just came to Nashville recently, and we went there and hung out, and that was fun as hell. Yeah, and think uh, you know, if three guys like us are like, let's hang out Saturday night. What should we do? See a movie? I don't know. Top Golf is pretty <laughs> rad. I just think there's like you're saying, there's more options. There's more shit to do. For me personally, you know, with the work we do on YouTube has has sort of pushed me toward going to less movies. Now some of it's anxiety, but I have a pretty good setup at home. Mm -hmm. Um sound and audio or visual visual wise 
it's not the, exactly the same as seeing something like Dunkirk in a theater. Yeah. But and that's why I went to see Dunkirk in a theater. But most movies that I see come up that I'm like, oh, I want to see that, like Shape of Water. Like I know I'm gonna see it eventually because we're probably gonna sin it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I have somehow learned a certain amount of patience to where I'm like, okay, I'll just order that Blu-ray. I'll see that movie in three months. I'll either like it or not, but I don't have to worry about going to the theater. I don't have to worry about crowds or anxiety or any mm-hmm. of that. So I see less movies than I ever did before. A lot of it has to do with my job. I don't think that presentation has anything. To- Although I did read an interesting thread on Reddit a couple weeks ago that some major chain um, might be Cinemark. Has apparently just given up caring about masking. Oh, really? And so, like, and there were multiple people chiming in from multiple cities with pictures of hmm. like what the screen looked like, like with the masking all fucked up or completely gone. Huh. Like they just don't change it or care anymore. They just project and whatever they're projecting on that. What you mean by masking is that the image doesn't go on the curtains, or right. or in some cases the image isn't like condensed into some weird box on the screen. Yeah whatever but masking is typically what from the projector to the screen you have a certain like image that shows up and and back in the day you used to put an aperture plate in a projector that used to like block yeah. the light that would go on to the top bottom and left and right of the screen now you can go in and, and i don't know even when digital came in the masking wasn't exactly right and you can actually see, like, in certain some cases where they don't have the... Something's not right about how it's throwing onto the screen because subtitles are getting cut off. Uh-huh. And uh, so that's another part of the masking, too. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's no, it's annoying as fuck because you're watching it and it's like image way over here on the, the folded little curtain shit on the <laughs> right, you know, and you're like, you know, I mean, it doesn't... You usually don't really register that information anyway when you're watching a movie with stuff that's way off to the right of the screen, but still it's noticeable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Or even the other opposite of that where there's no there's no curtain there and the mm-hmm. film doesn't take up the whole width of the screen and mm-hmm. it feels like you're watching some kind of like, you know, trimmed for TV version <laughs> yeah. of whatever <laughs> movie. Scan. Anyway, let's talk about The Greatest Showman. Okay. Oh, okay. This is probably one of the worst looking movies I think I've ever seen trailers for. Mm-hmm. Every time I see a trailer for this movie, I just kind of groan and, and roll my eyes. Put like five different yeah, ones there's out. There's a ton I of know. them. There's uh, I I think I understand the optimism from the people who made this movie. Hugh Jackman, people love him. People loved him, love him when he sings, whether it's at the Oscars or in Les Mis. Has he sung other other places? Did probably. He, he didn't sing as Wolverine, I know that. Um <laughs> And, you know, but it, it looks terrible. It looks like a movie that's trying to be a sanitized Moulin Rouge right. uh, kind of thing. Uh, but the biggest problem, uh, and, and I actually have homework for not YouTube, but the listeners. The biggest problem is basically they're completely glossing over the life of P.T. Barnum. Mm-hmm. And I think enough people will see this movie without realizing that P.T. Barnum was kind of an asshole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like... So my homework to you is to read up on P.T. Barnum, ah. specifically the first handful of things that he did as exhibits. Like he bought this like 70 year old slave woman oh. and passed her off as a 160 year old former slave of George Washington's and did, did a lot of stuff like abusing and exploiting black people as like freak show performers. Mm. Um, not good. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it's going to be prominently featured. It's like, well, a, it's it's like not, a girl that he worked with for a while who apparently accused him of like trying to poison her or something. Like, yeah. I, I really want you to do a deep dive like I did. I went down the rabbit hole and I knew, like I saw this trailer with my friend Jason when we saw Last Jedi, maybe. Um, and he looked at me because he always wants to know what I think of the trailer. And I was like, well, he was a piece of shit in real life. <laughs> uh, movie's probably not going to talk about that. But I had not remembered exactly how much of a piece of shit he is. But this is basically akin to making... A snappy, smiley musical about Christopher Columbus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, P.T. Barnum didn't slaughter people, but he was a, a through and through asshole mm. uh, who exploited people like crazy. And uh, I think you should check it out. Now there are there are plenty of these articles. I'm proud of the internet and the film reporters. 
Uh, I've seen at least four different articles taking the film to task for just kind of ignoring everything bad the guy ever did and mm. making he's, he's making him like Santa Claus, basically. Yeah. And <laughs> you know what? They can easily change that by just not making it P.T. fucking Barnum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Make it fictional. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, why does Q it have to be P.T.? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like P.T. Barnum is like some fucking box office draw or something. One of you these know? Uh, articles that I read, by the way, says, I, didn't, I haven't seen the movie, I won't, but one of the articles said he has three like two or three young daughters and the movie takes place over like 30 years and the kids never age oh shit oh really (laughs) i don't really know if that's true or not because i haven't seen the movie (laughs) that's still not as bad as just completely glossing over you know all of the true evil ignorant shit that he did before he (laughs) not to mention even when you get to happy times and like the elephants and the circus. Oh, yeah, yeah, The elephants were being abused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not this is not a dude to celebrate. Like you said, just make it a fictionalized version. Right. Um, and I think people could get behind well, it. Well, that's how they, that's how uh, Paul Thomas Anderson essentially dodged Scientology with the master. Yeah. Is that mm-hmm. he didn't make him L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. It was very much like it. But I think he he got away essentially scot free from mm-hmm. the wrath of these you know litigious. Well, it's the same thing uh, as uh, primary colors. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of times a movie can be better when they do that. Yeah. Than when it tries too hard to be faithful. No, I would I, I totally agree. And the master in particular, if that were a biopic, a straight up biopic, uh, instead of being more about Joaquin Phoenix's character, I would not like it nearly as much as I I do. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Mm-hmm. Next segment? Oh, yeah. I'm excited about this one. Doing the recommend slash warning. Totes amazeballs. There, girl. It won the Academy Award. Oh, for what? For best movie ever made. Um, okay, I got a couple under the recommend. I, I, I talked briefly about Molly's Game. I think that's a, it's a definitely a recommend. Can't wait. Although, did I, did I briefly talk about Molly's Game in the outtakes that are going to happen? I or? think so. So okay, so let's say in the outtakes, there's probably going to be something about Molly's game later. But I'm bringing it up for the first time ever that we've never <laughs> heard about it in this uh, in this podcast. Um, I think Sorkin has got this sort of this biopic thing down, uh, where uh, you know he did this in the Social Network and he did this in uh, Steve Jobs, where there's uh, one constant thing that is going on, but it flashes back to the other part of the story before this and everything. And again, Sorkin, you didn't know, you didn't need to know Sorkin did this to know Sorkin did this. <laughs> <laughs> it is so many different, like the way he does, the way he does dialogue and the way he cuts on certain words and, and everything. It's just in, in like the way somebody will bring something up and then they won't answer that question. And then somebody will like in the middle of another conversation, like you said this before, right. you know, like it's, <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah, yeah. They, they do. He does that a <laughs> lot. Like there's a part in this where Idris Elba is talking to Jessica Chastain and he's like, uh, how long is it? Bef- how long is it uh, since you last slept? And she's like, man, I've been doing all this stuff today. I've been blah, blah, blah. I did this on Tuesday. I did this on Wednesday. I did this on Thursday, whatever. They go on. They talk for another 10 to 15 minutes. And he goes, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> that is so social networking. Yes, it is. Yes, how, it is. Uh, how is the poker handled? Uh, and, and now, there's there's very little actual, like, poker being played. I mean, you, I mean, being shown in this. There's a few hands that they show in here where you know and they they you know it's very helpful like graphics like he's got a full house right now Uh. and blah 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 (laughs) and you know like yeah okay all right um uh, and there's like a couple of hands in there where you're like i don't quite understand even if this guy's a novice player i don't understand why he does this but i guess you know i guess if you want to play you put ten thousand dollars up for a poker game and you're just rich and dumb you know you do that type of thing there's a scene in there where michael Sarah, who's basically playing toby mcguire um is uh it, it bluffs this guy off the best hand he can possibly have and like i just i was like sitting there going i guess that happens <laughs> i guess it does but i don't understand why he does that and apparently that really happened that was something that really happened wow. and she wrote about it um but uh yeah the poker is sort of uh I, I don't know it's not it's not required for your enjoyment of this this is more about her and what she's doing to set up these games and who she's dealing with and everything and and like she you know it's apparently it's like 2 years after she last ran an illegal game that she's getting arrested and she has to find the lawyer and everything 
and the uh, you know the whole story is basically the you know they want to they want to get her to uh point to some russian mob people that were at her game that she didn't know were russian mob people mm. or didn't know that they were this deep into it or whatever and she keeps saying well i didn't know they were they, they these people say they want to come they have the money i don't ask questions i just let them play and you know i'm the banker and i just <laughs> you know that's the type of thing and uh but yeah idris elba is probably one of his best roles i've mm. ever seen him in i mean he's never i don't know if he'll ever top the wire mm -hmm. but this is dark uh, tower the, yeah, the dark tower for sure <laughs> um this and uh and that movie beast of a no beast of no nation beast of no nation yeah yeah uh that's those those are like his i think those are his top performers and this was this one's good hearing sorkin's dialogue coming out of idris elba is great i thought that is awesome so yeah I, I i fully recommend that movie it's uh it's 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 very good and and like i said aaron asked for the top five i immediately put it in my top five mm. uh another one that i want to talk about is a netflix series called dark Mm. i uh was told uh to watch this from jacob from modern horrors oh no. um and uh it is a german tv series it's a sci-fi um i guess a little bit of horror here and there but it's german i, and I suggest that if you want to watch this you watch it with the german audio and the english subtitles if you can't understand german um <laughs> if you can uh, that would be weird <laughs> because because the dub oh the dubs are just awful i, I don't know how it. people deal with mm -hmm. dubs at all yeah. like their mouths are just not matching up with what's being said uh but uh but dark is a, is a time travel show um it is about this town in germany that uh, has a nuclear plant and uh kids are coming up missing Mm. and uh so that you know so everybody's trying to figure out you know what's exact what's exactly happening to these kids who's responsible all that and and you know you do find so it goes over uh there's three different uh time periods there's a 1953 1986 and 2019 mm -hmm. uh so it goes through all this stuff and it's basically saying everything in the future affects the past everything in the past affects the future and it's all this just cyclical thing and it's just fun uh it, it i may have to watch it again because there's so many characters and so many characters playing younger versions and so many you know so, so many different like that going on that i didn't know exactly like every single instance of what character was being on the screen but it's not required for you to know like every single last thing and i'm i'm gonna watch it again because i enjoyed it that much awesome mm. is it one Excellent. season it's one season nice so far but yeah i enjoyed this heavily i i, I binged it basically over this past week nice wow. mm -hmm. all right Good check one. that out so i have two recommends as well mm -hmm. <clears throat> i think i've mentioned before of my shameful interest and addiction uh to the lifetime movies mm-hmm <laughs> um it's the not the christmas ones right like the hallmark christmas i don't get on board with all that mm. shit um uh, but anything to do with like m hot people and murder <laughs> <laughs> i will i will sit through most any lifetime movie network and i have one on my warnings for later but i have got one on my recommend for this week specifically for you two even if the listeners don't want to watch and it's uh, it's Drew Peterson, Untouchable. Mm -hmm. Oh, now this is Rob Lowe, right? Playing the cop that killed at least one, maybe multiple wives. Mm -hmm. Kaylee Cuoco is in this from Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. Um, but and and this movie is not great. None of these movies are great. I'm <laughs> recommending this movie because of Rob Lowe's performance, because he talks like you've never heard him talk. He's doing some kind. I think he's doing an impression of it's this a Chicago guy, guy right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so there's a little bit of an accent, a little bit of an interesting delivery. Uh, he's just skeezy. Yeah, he looks skeezy. You almost wonder how he ever landed as many wives as he did. Yeah, because he looks and talks so weird and skeezy. I am mesmerized by Rob Lowe's performance in this movie. <laughs> it is so understated. I think it's brilliant. Interesting. Mm. And if you've seen it, tell me I'm right or wrong. <laughs> I'm not the rest of the movie. You can take or leave, <laughs> but like uh, Tom Cruise's brother is in this. Oh, uh, the guy that was on Lost, William Mapather. Yeah, Mapather, uh, <laughs> something like that. A couple other Mapather, Math Mathapur. I always like say that. it, M M Maypother. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> but I've just I've never seen Rob Lowe do anything like this. Mm -hmm. uh, 
before or since. And I just, I can't, every time I see it on the TV guy when I'm flipping, I watch it. I've seen part of it. And I actually, we lived through a lot of that trial and all that craziness yeah. when we were in Chicago. It was all over the news. And uh, yeah, you're right. The guy exudes this weird charm even while he's being like a, a total scumbag like when they brought him into the prison i don't know if this is in the movie but they brought him into the prison he's like yelling he's like i'm the big baller now and like oh shit like in, that. in the movie they're like they tell him to strip when they're booking him into prison he's like get a good look or something yeah. like that like he's like <laughs> it's crazy. He's, it, he at least the movie portrays him to be at some point he gets so enamored with his own celebrity that he kind of gets delusional. Of course, this is a person that tried to cover up one, maybe more murders, right. so he probably was delusional to begin with. Um, but basically, the movie picks up um, where he and his wife have split up, and he's now starts dating Kaylee Kuoko. Mm. And I think the ex-wife even warns her, "You watch out. He's not what you think he is." There's and, definitely a scene. Like and then he goes to <laughs> and he kills her, the ex-wife. And then at some point, Kaylee Kuoko goes missing. And he makes up this story that she left him for some other guy out on the coast or what have you. And he just sticks to it. Like, mm -hmm. so if, if I say it enough, people will believe it. And no one does. It's fascinating. I'm yeah. fascinated by the real case. Um, I'm fascinated by the Lifetime movie version. Of it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> anyway, just watch a few minutes. I'm not actually going to ask you to spend <laughs> two hours of your life on a Lifetime movie network. But I just want to know if you guys think I'm crazy about Rob Lowe in that movie right. because he very it, it intrigues me. Uh, my other recommend uh, is something that Chris kind of recommended unofficially a few weeks ago in the podcast, and then th that's a Sam Raimi film called A Simple Plan. Ooh, mm. great oh, one! Yeah. Now this has been playing on Stars or Showtime. Every time I mention, I, I just rattle them all off because I never know which channel right. I'm actually on. Um, <clears throat> it's been playing a lot, and and over the last week or two, um, it has been the better option over something else multiple times. And I think Fargo really fucked this movie over, yeah. at least in terms of how much it looked like Fargo when yeah. it came out. Well, and, and it's uh, Raimi is a buddy of the Coens. Well, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of has that some some blending in there. Yeah, and there's some twisted comedy. There's a snowy setting. Mm. There's murder. There's unique characters. I think there's a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. But if, th if that has kept you away, watch A Simple Plan. It's kind of fucking awesome I, yeah. this is my favorite bill paxton performance okay and that's far. what i wrote in my notes i'm pretty sure this is my favorite bill paxton maybe edge of tomorrow mm. because it's so unexpected yeah uh, in the humor of it um but just for character depth uh unlike twister where his earnestness sometimes feels forced and fake in this movie by the end of it i feel like you genuinely buy that he and billy bob are brothers mm -hmm. that he loves billy bob even though billy bob is just stupid yeah and a, a world biggest fuck up uh but there's really great acting here i think billy bob's performance is completely overshadowed by you know fargo overshadowing the movie uh, overshadowing the movie and billy bob just having such a varied career he's fucking fantastic he's in this great movie and he's playing playing a guy who is somewhat mentally challenged i don't think the movie ever explains you know it's not like down syndrome or something mm. but um <clears throat> so they stumble upon this money this crash plane in the middle of the woods, and there's money in it, uh, and they take it. And where it goes from there, I'll leave it to you. Uh, that probably happens in the first 15 minutes. Uh, but I think it takes at least three turns you don't expect. Mm -hmm. um, much like Drive, when I brought that up the other day, it does get shockingly violent a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is really a drama, and it's really kind of a, a brother drama, a family drama. And uh, it's just, I, every time I see bits and pieces of it, I think it's better than the previous time. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. I think you should watch it. Yeah, uh, Bill Paxton's one of those actors. It, he has been in a lot of movies where he's been sort of forced to act a certain way and you're like either you're really with it or you're, you can't be with <laughs> right, it. Right. Just, he's 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 one of the more interesting character actors i think we've yeah. ever had and just before he died he had a couple of podcasts last year uh, listen to the one that he did with mark maron because it's uh he has a lot of great stories and he is probably one of the most engaging person people i've ever heard on a podcast because he's so 
so happy about everything. And I, I think even at this was even at the time he was diagnosed with whatever he had. And, everything. Oh. and he's just sitting there talking about, you know, just movies and like, you know, and, and he, Mark Maron will bring up aliens. Yeah, man, I love aliens, <laughs> man. That was big for me, man. You know, <laughs> There's people always coming down the street saying, game over, man. I love that. You know, it's <laughs> fucking great. Awesome. Uh, for my recommend, so my, like fascination with Stanley Kubrick has now turned into full on obsession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, primarily because of the, the, the package that Chris and Jeremy got for me of, of his later discography, basically starting from Lolita all the way into eyes wide shut. And it's also got a documentary on there uh, called Stanley Kubrick life in pictures. Mm. And it goes, it's two and a half hours long. Wow. It goes through everything. And from, you know, his start with, you know, stuff like the killing and paths of glory and all that stuff. And then it starts really gaining strength and it goes into the psyche of him and interviews his wife and his kids and mm. things like that. It is fucking compelling. And it shows a lot of clips of the movies that he's done. And you can see they break down the film style. It's interviews with Spielberg and Scorsese. Awesome. Woody Allen. Like every there's little Bon Mots in this thing that absolutely will destroy you, especially if you're you're a big Kubrick fan. Like Woody Allen uh, comes on and says, the first time that I watched 2001, I didn't like it very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the next time I was seeing this woman and this woman says, I want to go see 2001. And I liked it a little better. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw it for a third time and I loved it. You know, that I've kind of seen thing. this documentary. It was on HBO, I think, at one point. Uh -huh. and I remember him saying that. Yeah. that's a great documentary. It's fantastic. The whole thing about Kubrick doing Napoleon, uh, a Napoleon uh, movie, getting everything ready, getting locations. They're literally going out to film this movie and then another Napoleon movie comes out and doesn't do very well and just basically says, I'm, I'm just going to scrap it. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. The fact that, that Kirk Douglas basically hired him, uh, rented Kubrick uh, for Spartacus, and they had all kinds of issues going back and forth. And it's narrated by Tom Cruise, actually, and then, of course, it ends with Eyes Wide Shut. The great thing about this documentary is that a lot of documentaries, like if you made one about Scorsese right now, you would feel like, oh, that's really cool, but it's incomplete because yeah. he's probably going to make five, six more movies at least. Mm -hmm. uh, this is finite because it's the entire breadth of Kubrick's career, and you can step back. It's It's been far enough uh, behind that we can really evaluate it, and it's a finite story. It ends with uh, you know the, his, his death right after Eyes Wide Shut. Really, really compelling. Uh, you should definitely watch it. Speaking of Scorsese, did you see the set photos? Like, he's making a movie right now with De Niro and Pacino and Joe Pesci, and it's about some real-life John Gotti, maybe. Right. It's, um, uh, this is The Irishman or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that. But the photograph on set is uh, the, the lifts in De Niro's shoes to make him as much taller than Pacino as his character would be in real life. Oh, yeah. And the lifts look like this. They're like oh, five, seriously? six. I mean, I was having like Seinfeld flashbacks. <laughs> like, he's heightening. He's heightening. <laughs> That's funny because you would think that just by being normal size, like he would tower over Pacino. You know, Pacino's I like just, five, four. Or something I'm convinced like nobody in Hollywood <laughs> is as tall or as short as we think they are. Yeah. Everybody, if you think they're short, they're super tall. If you think they're tall, they're not. They're short. Yeah. They're yeah. little munchkins. Yeah. By the way, this is a, uh, apparently. I don't know if it's just about Jimmy Hoffa, but Al Pacino plays Jimmy Hoffa. Okay. But I've heard about this movie for quite some time. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of looking for. It's supposed to be Netflix, right? Uh, maybe. I think that's what. It I is. just hope it's more heat. Than it is Righteous Kill. <laughs> God, I saw Righteous Kill the other day. That's so. Uh, why did you scary. watch that? I just I was eating lunch and I was like, "Here, it's on." Look, there's Pacino arguing with De Niro, and then there's this weird subplot of Carlo Gugino or Gugino is like into S and M or something yeah. like that, and she gets slapped around by De Niro, and mm -hmm. she likes it. Yeah, and she used to date Pacino, and it's fucked up. The yeah. whole thing is fucked yeah. up. Yep. Yep. What you yeah, did was righteous. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. <laughs> but anyway, was, was like 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 all time, all time, like give away the killer line, all time. <laughs> like we're watching a movie called Righteous Kill. He said that kill was righteous. <laughs> 
<laughs> he must have done it. <laughs> I think they should have gotten uh, the Andrew Stanton from Finding Nemo to righteous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that deal was righteous. Dude. I'll give my warning because it's silly. Let's say a Danger, Will Robinson. I got caught watching a movie called Christmas Cookies at my Ooh, parents. Oh, caught God. by whom? Uh, well, I mean, I got kind of sucked into a vortex where it was after dinner and during Christmas Eve uh, when I got together with my family. We had lunch, bellies full, sitting in a recliner. Somebody puts on Hallmark Movie Channel. Mm-hmm. And we end up watching this movie called Christmas Cookies. Mm. And every part of it. My father and I were watching. He's like, man, listen, your mom watches these all the time. I'll call out the plot. I've never seen this movie. And he's like, you know, she's like a business ex- executive going to this small town. She turns out to be a business executive <laughs> going to this small town. The the owner of the business is going to be a hot guy that she wants, to, <laughs> that she hates at first, and then she'll come around to love. Exactly what happened. Oh, oh, wow. It was such a waste of like 90 minutes of my time, but we just... We were too full and too lazy to really turn it off. But don't, if you find that on your TV, run, run. It's terrible. It's like, um, I have this thing, and I know you guys don't necessarily agree. I kind of enjoyed Family Guy for a little while, but any of the other Seth MacFarlane cartoons, The Cleveland Show, Mm -hmm. or especially American Dad, like it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. Mm -hmm. And I watch all these Friends reruns all the time, and TBS is one of the channels that plays Friends reruns for like four hours. And then goes into an American Dad marathon of reruns, and if I, like as soon as it starts, I'm like, ah, where's the remote? I got to change it. Oh God, I got to like every second that American Dad is on my TV sucks a little bit of my soul away. Good morning, USA. Oh God, I can't stand it. <clears throat> that was a you. Bring, I don't even know what movie I was watching, but you know, it was like a lifetime thing. That same thing happened to me. Uh, last year when i went to visit my brother and everything we had just gotten done with like some food or whatever and then we sat on the couch and suddenly some like lifetime movies on and it was a christmas movie and it was you know it's um, oddly a lot like what you were talking about they're all like that and uh and like <laughs> and like there was a there was a magical elf in it oh we didn't and, have a magical elf. and uh all that i didn't wasn't paying much attention it was more like look up and you see some bullshit and then you start talking <laughs> and then you look back up and you're like oh how'd they get to the here i don't know fuck it um <laughs> yeah those movies are, are awful i don't i don't recommend going to lifetime in general <laughs> yeah. uh I, actually i just never go to it so i was surprised to see both of you had pitched some sort of lifetime movie <laughs> well I'm this like, is hallmark this is not hot people killing. It's the same each fucking other. thing. Yeah. Hallmark lifetime. This was probably Hallmark too. Whatever yeah, this true. was. So I don't know. I, I just get them all confused. <laughs> yes, just avoid at all yeah, costs. Yeah, exactly. Um, movie I've seen recently that uh, no one should see, but apparently lots of people saw. I still don't get that. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man Tell No Tell. Uh. Uh, definitely tipping our hand here that this is a fucking sins video that's <laughs> yeah. coming out. Yeah, this is the fifth Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, I don't know what else we have to say about this character anymore. Mm. I don't understand. Like, it, it, It's one of those things, like, you know, in the first one, there's some sort of specialness to it where it's like, oh, I didn't know that there were ghosts on a ship and they were running that ship and they're, you know, and there's a curse and everything. It seems like that's the only thing that's, that's going on in that Pirates of the Caribbean world in that first one. And then as you get through some more it's like it, this is like a common occurrence yeah like how every do, ship how has do ghosts. people don't how do well, how come people don't believe in this shit anymore <laughs> it's everywhere you know like uh yeah and yeah this one's it's exactly like the first one dead people on a ship they ha- they want to get rid of their curse um you know and it's uh, got to find the 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 magical uh, doobly doo or whatever that <laughs> that uh that gets them away from the curse or whatever and actually in this one it's th- they have a curse um is it henry henry turner who's the son of will turner is trying to get will off the ship that he apparently well he he does he's captaining that ship that stellan scars guard was right at the end of that world's end that's his dad he took over for him and the third one you probably don't remember that ship. <laughs> the uh the the end credits of that movie shows kira knightley and and a kid that looks remarkably similar to the kid that they used later on <laughs> um uh going on a hill and seeing like this big green flash of whatever and oh it's will he's back he's here for like a 
can step on land every 10 years or whatever and you know okay so, you know, he, but this story starts off with him looking a lot like how Stellan Skarsgård did in the third one which is weird because he's the captain of that ship now he's not he's like he's like the Bill Nye character yeah yeah and uh i mean he's he's not gonna turn squiddy he's not gonna turn <laughs> you don't want to mess with orlando bloom's yeah, pretty face too much I, I don't get i didn't get that at all so but this kid this is the stupidest part and it's the main part it's the main plot of this movie he wants to break his father's curse so that he'll come home mind you he's seen his dad one time in his life <laughs> Uh, because he can only show up on land t every 10 years <laughs> like there's this uh, he's got this some sudden need to like see his fight like they've been having like christmases together and <laughs> I'm like i don't understand that but like the the dumbest part of this movie is they have to find poseidon's trident <laughs> and it's like there's a there's a girl in here she's in maze runner and uh and uh she's she's like basically taking over the Kira knightley role mm. and, and will turner's son is taking over the will turner role or whatever um she is a person of science Ooh. and she and this and henry starts telling her like you know there's like ghosts out there and there's all that and she's like you know these things aren't supported by science but she's there to talk to him about getting poseidon's trident <laughs> and i was like so wait a minute <laughs> So ghosts and stuff, that's that's not science. <laughs> Poseidon's trident, yep, totally that's on board. That's totally because science. it's in Galileo's fucking diary. <laughs> and uh and just like I, you know, I was I was just uh, befuddled. But again, it's this is another one of those bullshit pirates movies where there's it, all the same things are gonna happen. Mm. They have boat battles, there's sword fights in <laughs> stupid places, there's, you know, accidental jumping into some sort of like you know uh building of some sort and doing a sword fight or like uh oh i got caught by this person or whatever it's just it, it's all the same and johnny depp really does look like he's slumming it now he mm. just he's just he's just kind of like wake me up when this is over <laughs> like every time he says something now it's like god you sound so tired yeah. when you say this you know you just you just sound like you don't yeah, even he's gotta he's gotta pay off those debts i was man. gonna say he might have some financial reasons for <laughs> saying yes to that maybe. yeah i mean I, I don't doubt it but i i was i was dumbfounded as to why this movie made here in america 172 million dollars really yeah now the budget for this movie was 230 million i know they shot it two years ago they shot it in 2015 and so like i'm sure there was all sorts of other little issues and everything and who knows maybe they maybe they were hoping all this johnny depp news would would blow over or something yeah. i don't know mm. um but um 172 and it million. probably cleaned up worldwide and it made too, 622 right? million elsewhere so it's a nearly 800 million dollars it made and it's gonna be another one and uh I just i just i don't get it i don't understand it there's no there's everything about it is tired even javier bardem who's like a just always likable <laughs> i'm like fuck you for taking this movie i know your wife penelope cruz took the last one but so you don't have to you don't have to continue it oh man uh so yeah uh steer clear of it i don't I actually know nobody who has seen this movie at all. $172 million it That's made here crazy. in the U.S. Oh, my God. Yo all right. So my, here's my warning. 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 I actually am going to do one quick one because I said I was going to, and then I'm going to do the real one. The quick one is my lifetime movie warning. Uh -huh. right? I recommended the Rob Lowe one. I want to steer you away from one called Jody Arias' Dirty Little Secret. Yeah. I've seen part of this one, too. Now, this is the girl who was in Malcolm in the Middle as, like, a classmate, uh -huh. and then I next saw her on Lost as, like, one of... Well, she's Ben's daughter? She's the... Isn't she the French woman's daughter? The French woman's daughter. Yeah. Somebody's daughter. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, which oh, they shot she is Ben's. several years later, she's all grown up, and she's <laughs> <Yeah>. grown up. <laughs> he grown up. Grown up. <laughs> and this movie is all about PG-rated sex. Uh-huh. So she's writhing around. This is very uncomfortable for me because I am seeing nerdy Malcolm's classmate <laughs> playing sexy bimbo killer. There's this whole Mormon subplot. The guy she's dating is a Mormon. Mm. 
and of course Mormons don't have the sex, right? But and so he like has to hide her, <laughs> and then of course this is based on a true story. She ends uh-huh. up stabbing him in the shower like seventeen times out of jealousy, <clears throat> and now she's in prison. And of course they made a movie about it. this movie is not redeemable in any way. There's no <laughs> Rob Lowe is doing something cool here in this movie. There's nothing you need to watch in this movie. That was actually quick, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, the real one I want to steer you away from is, uh, is a movie I keep seeing on one of the movie channels, and it's called uh, Brooklyn's Finest. Oh, yeah. I think I brought this up before, but not as a, as a hard warning. This is an Anton Fuqua movie about crooked cops oh, in New yeah. York. Here's the cast. Ethan Hawke, Don Cheadle, Richard Gere, Wesley Snipes, Will Patton, Lily Taylor, Michael Kenneth Williams, Ellen Barkin, and Vincent D'Onofrio. Mm-hmm. Wow. And this movie is boring as hell. Really? Now, none of those Fuqua... Crooked Cops and that cast, yeah, you could you should be able to sleepwalk through that making that <laughs> mm-hmm. and make something interesting for me. And I just kept watching, going, "Well, when is it gonna get good? When is it gonna get good? Sooner or later, it's gonna get good, right?" And it ultimately it feels like like a B movie that somehow landed A actors. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, you know, it feels like the kind of movie that Richard Grieco should be in, <laughs> yeah, instead of Richard Gere. There's a scene where Richard Gere, who's a cop, goes to his favorite prostitute. And outside, he's outside her apartment, and he hears that she's still fucking her previous client. I think he even looks at them. Mm-hmm. He waits. Client leaves. He goes in and fucks her. Ah, oh, uh, all right, all right. I mean, <laughs> this. I, I was shocked by how little there is positive in this movie, and I basically lost two hours of my life through bore. So I would steer you away from Brooklyn's finest. That's crazy. It almost reminds me of like Public Enemies. Like I don't yeah. know how Michael Mann and Christian Bale and Johnny Depp Agreed. at that point. Yeah. Could make a boring fucking movie. I yeah. agree, did. Yeah. yeah, good comparison. But yeah, that uh, that uh, that girl that you're talking about, or was it Tania Raymond yes. or something like that? Yes. She she um, I believe she was the French woman's daughter, and then didn't Ben like adopt her or something like that? Is I that think what you're that... right. I think I think it, she's first presented in the show as Ben's daughter, and then we later find out he basically stole her from the French. Yeah, woman. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We get we got we got called out on Facebook for not knowing what the fuck was going on in Lost. By the way. Oh really? Really? Mm-hmm. No. You well, mean like, by people who thought the ending was all explained? I don't know. They said that uh, that uh, you know the, the island wasn't purgatory, and I was like, well, at the end they're at a church and they're waiting to go to heaven, and uh, you know it seems like they're kind of saying it's purgatory, but. The you know, uh, Cuse and Lindelof both said it wasn't purgatory. They both came out and said that, but I, I think to me it it is what it is. Nick Saban said he wasn't going to be the coach of Alabama ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> ever. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's just it's like it, to me it's like uh, you had you know you had it was an article in 2014, so it was four years after the finale and everything. Like by that time, you have a you know pretty good idea of how to just say that it wasn't, and and you know no no it wasn't totally, but you know I, I know what I saw. Yeah, <laughs> I saw a bunch of people in a church. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to call people out or whatever. It's just it was just it was funny. We're bringing up lost again, and, this, and, and, I, and, and that's fresh in my mind because somebody said well, you didn't understand that show. I was like, well, wait I they- watched the fuck out of Lost. <laughs> and read everything about it. <laughs> Wait till they hear us mess up the daughter of Ben slash. Yeah, friend. yeah. Oh, yeah. Blood boiling right now. <laughs> oh, it's not Ben's daughter. He stole her from the French. Oh, he got there eventually. Okay, good. Oh, my goodness. You want to do some fantasy casting? Some fantasy casting. Is this just fantasy? No stars. No stars. I want Bruce Willis. Not Bruce Willis. No Schwarzenegger. Junior Robbins. This is bad. Bad for movie stars everywhere. Oh, my God. Now, listen, this is going to be a fun one, but strangely enough, we got a question from a listener about a movie that's going to be perfect for next week that I'll I'll just tease here. I'll tell you guys later on, but uh, tune in next week. It's going to be really super awesome. The recasting? Mm, the yes. fantasy casting? Yes. Okay. Kick oh, us off, Barrett. Barrett. All right. So, kick us. Listen, this is New Year's Day. Everybody's been out partying All or gone. enjoying with family <laughs> or just kind of hanging out, that kind of thing, enjoying festivities by yourself. Listen, it's it's party time though. It's party season. It's excellent. So uh, P A R T Y, cause I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes before Part B. Part A. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, because of that, we're gonna do a party movie that revolves around uh, a lot of uh, opulence and and celebration. The Great Gatsby. Mm-hmm. Now, The Great Gatsby has had I don't know how many remakes, but the most recent one 
was 2013. Yep. Baz Luhrmann mm-hmm. with Leo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire. And there was another one with uh, Robert Redford and Mia Farrow back in the 70s. Okay. And uh, Carey Mulligan is in this one and uh, Joel Edgerton, I believe, uh, in, in this mm-hmm. remake. Now, Baz Luhrmann has his style. Uh, I've never really been a fan of it. It's kind of like Chris and Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. How mm-hmm. many times can we fuck up that guy's name? Yeah, all uh, at least you didn't try calling him Benicio. <laughs> But uh, I've never been really a fan of his style. Now, this is a perfectly fine movie, I guess. It's not really objectionable, uh, but it's about The Great Gatsby, which is uh, Jay Gatsby is this um, wealthy dude that hosts parties that is pining for a lost love. Um, there's a kid from, or a guy from, you know, on the other side of the tracks that finds himself in this kind of atmosphere. The lost love also has has a husband and they have, he has a mistress that also has a husband. So there's six main cast members in this Mm -hmm. that we are going to now recast. So I got to tell you, it was an inspired choice to go with Leo DiCaprio for, for Jay Gatsby because he radiates this charm and opulence and things like that. But I, I kind of want like a little more because his backstory is a lot more complicated. I want him to have a darker side. And for that, I'm going to have Tom Hardy as Jay Gatsby. Mm. Uh, now, the the, the Tobey Maguire character, uh, who's Nick um, in in the Baz Luhrmann version, he's kind of wide eyed and innocent and everything like that. But it turns into more of like kind of a knowing type of role. And I got to have somebody solid to go up against Tom Hardy, who's a, just a fucking powerhouse. So I'm going to choose Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. Oh. Now both of those actors are a little bit older than you know the the literary characters, but we're fucking recasting here. We can take a little bit of liberty. and they can pass for 30s or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's going to be a tense relationship. Can you imagine the tension that those guys can generate together in some of those scenes? It's knife cuttable. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, for Daisy, who's Jay's lost love, who's now married to Tom. Uh, Daisy comes from money. She comes from Louisville money. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and she has the world on her plate for that reason. I'm going to take future royalty, Meghan Markle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She's an actress. (laughs) Married to, uh, Prince Harry. Uh, she was in the, the show Suits. Never really saw it, but, uh. Hey, you know, mm-hmm. I figure she's used to that kind of lifestyle, so she could pull it off. Oh, I see. Uh, with Tom, Tom is kind of a sinister character. He's got a lot of business going on. He's got a side piece going on. He's got, you know, this relationship with Daisy. Um, a guy that really, like, arrested my attention this year was Caleb Landry Jones mm-hmm. in Get Out. Yep. He's pure menace. Which one is he? He's the the brother uh, that yeah. uh, He's is fucked up. just... And I, I wouldn't have thought that because he plays Banshee in X-Men First Class. Mm-hmm. And that's basically the only time I've ever seen him before. Yep. And the way that he portrays that character in Get Out is fucking sinister, man. So I think he'd be a good Tom. The I, I, I use the term side piece, but the mistress uh, <laughs> in, in this tale is Myrtle. Come Myrtle on. is from kind of like the, 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 the wrong end of town. And because I want to uh, to have like somebody with some authenticity, Mila Kunis is going to be Myrtle Ooh, for me. Oh. And uh, Myrtle's husband, uh, who is essentially the most innocent person in this yep. uh, this whole book and movie, is going to be played by Norman Reedus. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you think he screams innocence? You got, huh? you got, you got some uh, some real like character faces in yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Norman Reedus and Caleb Landry Jones have yeah. have very marked looking faces. Like just you know just you know who they are immediately every time you see them. It's mm-hmm. uh, they just very. Just, yeah, just character faces. Yeah, you know, uh, but they're they're good actors too. Exactly. So. I don't know uh, who I'm gonna get to direct this. That's just the the casting. But I don't know if mm. you guys did directors. I did director and score. Oh, did you do director? I didn't, but I thought of some while you were talking. Nice. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that's my cast. What do you good guys one. Think? All right. Well, uh, this is uh, this was interesting for me because I hated this book. Oh really? And like. There was this, it was about 10 years ago, maybe, my brother decided, I'm going to go through and read all these classics that, for whatever reason, we weren't given to read in school, but other kids were at their schools. And then he he would send it to me after he read it. He did this like with like five, 10 different books. So Catch-22 was one of the first ones. Mm, I love that book. Yeah. 
Um, and then Catcher in the Rye, fucking hated that book. Are you serious? Yeah. And wow. then uh, this one, uh, Great Gatsby, and I didn't like that book either. Uh, this may be why we stopped doing this. I don't know. So, <laughs> and my only connection to The Great Gatsby is the Leo movie, mm-hmm. which I saw once and don't super remember. <laughs> so, as I said in my notes, I had to Google who some of these people were. Mostly, I was looking on the IMDb wh- who played this character, mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of how I decided to go through it. So, Gatsby, I want Andrew Garfield. Mm. Oh, nice. Because we've really only seen him either do awkward or like aw shucks, like in Hacksaw Ridge. Mm-hmm. But I th- I would like to see him do dashing, charming, and debonair. I think he could pull it off. Mm-hmm. I think he's got the looks. He's the right age, unlike Tom Hardy. <laughs> um, and then for the Tobey Maguire character, I'm going with Logan Lerman, Percy Jackson himself, nice, because yeah. I think he could do a really good take on that wide-eyed kid from the wrong side of the tracks who's enthralled by this new environment he finds himself in. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Daisy, I'm going Kristen Stewart. Mm. Oh, nice. Because I don't think we've ever seen her play this kind of character. But not, not, not in a distant period role, not the wealthy heiress. Yeah, no, I like that because she's wealthy and she's idealized, but she's not virginal. And I think that's true. Uh, the character itself. Right. And I think I've Kristen also seen, Stewart can handle that. Yeah. Kristen Stewart's a better actress than she gets credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think only in like maybe a couple ad campaigns or fashion spreads, I've seen her done up like she's from the 30s or 20s before. Mm-hmm. I think she could look the, the, the role really well. Yeah. She's a good actress. A little bit of a crush on her. <laughs> <laughs> for Tom who I even wrote in my notes, if this is the asshole guy that, the, <laughs> that I think he is, I go with Paul Dano. Yeah. Oh, nice. Because I think he could be a good, menacing, thuggy husband who's cheating on his wife. I like that. I wonder what Paul things. Dano's been doing lately. He's directing a movie. Is he really? He's doing his first directorial debut, and he's got some really good actors in it, too. Huh. Um, so, and I'm forgetting everything else I've, I've read about it, but I've read about it <laughs> twice now. Interesting. Um, and I think they're actually shooting right now. Hmm. Uh, all right, and then Myrtle, this is the side piece. Yes. Chloe Grace Moritz. Mm. Uh, interesting. Somebody else, I think, would look right at home in 1920s, 30s uh-huh. garb. Um, and I think that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> How old is she now? She's 20. She's 20? Yep. She's old enough to be a side piece. <laughs> you just you have an- Amityville horror and you fresh in your brain right. when she's like seven years old or whatever. Uh, George is the nice guy husband. Mm-hmm. Um, Zach Efron, because we were just saying mm, we wanted to see him do mm. more dramatic work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could totally see comedy that. stuff. I could see him doing that. I'm gonna have this directed by Sam Mendes. Yeah, oh, nice. And scored by Thomas Newman. Now, the way Mendes handled the period stuff in Road to Perdition gives me absolute faith. He also just does. He has gorgeous shots in all of his movies, um, but he doesn't have that. Baz Luhrmann distinctive style that's going to imprint the film Mm -hmm. um, in a way that that may do harm. Right. Uh, Because he's done Bond. He's done American Beauty, Road to Perdition. He's been all over the place here. Um, I think he can handle it really well. Of course, Mm -hmm. he almost always works with Thomas Newman. So Mm -hmm. throwing aboard Thomas Newman. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Call me Hollywood. All right. Uh, I'm going to do an all Spanish Gatsby. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I love your recasting. Um, Yep. The, uh, Can it be Spanish language, I, too? I, yes, I actually thought that. I was thinking we could do this all in Spanish. Yeah. If there's anything, if there's any fucking story that needs color to it, it's fucking Great Gatsby. Ah, uh, that's true. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the modern day. Yes. Like back then, sure. In the jazz age, we're fine. Yeah. yeah. But here, we need to have some color, and we're going to make an all Spanish Great Gatsby. We may have to change the names. Uh-huh. I don't know. The Great Gatsbatico. Yes. Is that, <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that racist? Wait, was I just accidentally racist? I remember when I took Spanish. They taught me that Ito is how you make something little. Yes. So grandma is abuela, but yeah. if you have a tiny grandma, she's abuelito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was doing Gatsbatito. No, no, no. You, you made it Spanish. Gatsbatito? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! I hate being accidentally racist. All right, let's do it. Um, so uh, for Gatsby, I'm going to have Oscar Isaac. Nice. All right. Um, I think he would perfectly play off, play Gatsby. Good looking dude and like has all that charisma and everything. Yeah, and good call. Nick is going to be Gael Garcia Bernal. Nice. Um, Little Star Wars connection there. Was he, 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 was, uh, they weren't you're thinking in the, Diego Luna. Shit. 
Well, Diego Luna coming up. Um, <laughs> it'll, be a, it'll be an E2 Mama Tambien <laughs> reunion. Uh, Daisy, I have Zoe Saldana. Oh, uh, okay. Obviously gorgeous, and I think can play that type of that type of. Character. She's in Live by Night with Ben Affleck. Is she? I don't know why I said that, mm. but she is. <laughs> um, Tom, this is going to be a little bit older than these other characters, but Javier Bardem is going to play Tom. All right, I can see All this. Right. Um, and which you know, you, you, I think you'll be rightfully grossed out when you find out that Myrtle is Selena Gomez. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So you asked how old Chloe Grace was. You have to ask how old Selena is. Selena uh, Gomez is twenty five. Yeah, um, yeah. She's she's the same age as Jennifer Lawrence, right? Uh, Jennifer Lawrence is a little older than her. No, oh, okay. Jennifer Lawrence is like twenty seven. No, okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, Javier, Javier Bardem and Selena Gomez are going to have an affair, and that's yeah. a good thirty years. Yeah, yeah. that's creepy. Um, I like and then it. Uh, she's going to be man <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, you have to be, you have to have a little bit of like a, like a feel bad pit in your stomach when yeah. you, when you, when you think about this. And George will be Diego Luna, ah. the aforementioned Diego Luna. Um, at one point, I did have him as Nick, uh -huh. and I had Gael Garcia Bernal as Gatsby. But then I, but then I started researching, and I saw that Oscar Isaac uh, has a, I think, a Guatemalan mother mm -hmm. and a Cuban father. Wow! I didn't know he was Spanish no, at all. I didn't either. And I was like, oh, he's perfect. So I had, I sort of, you know, moved him down. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, directed by Alfonso Cuarón. Oh, oh, oh nice. he do a good. He could bring some of that Great Expectations quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and, done some period work yeah, too. I mm -hmm. love that. Oh, I yeah. love that aesthetic. Yeah, and uh, music from Gustavo Santaolalla. Oh, oh nice. is that the Brokeback Mountain? Guy? Broke back mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Gustavo Santalaya. The Babel guy. Gustavo Santalaya. Gustavo Santalaya. Yeah. Gustavo. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but I know that there's one L, and that's got to be an, a, a, an O sound, and then there's two L's. So that's a Y sound. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gustavo Santalaya. Or, sounds right. One of my Spanish teacher, he was from the Yucatan Peninsula, and in particular that region, they, the double L, they don't do the Y, they do a Z. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. So when we were learning Spanish, we learned, uh, like, instead of me llamo es Jeremy, it was me llamo es Jeremy. Interesting. Mm. So maybe he's Gustavo Santalaja. <laughs> <laughs> if he's from the Yucatan, and maybe he's. From, I know, as far as I know. <laughs> um, let's never recast Lolita. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting in that documentary when they were talking about Lolita, I don't think I've ever read the book actually but i i think i made the comment last week that he got nabokov like to write the screenplay mm -hmm. so i figured it's it's very much like the book it's nothing like the i book. have i have read the book and i don't remember much I, I remember i remember like the first like opening paragraphs of it like the reason why he goes through all this is because he he never was in love when he was that age right and so he felt like he met he missed something and as he got older, he was like, that's why he had this, you know, unnatural sort of attraction towards these these young girls. But uh, I remember reading it a long time ago. I didn't remember it, the movie being anything like it because when I watched Lolita, like when I watched Lolita, I was like, yeah, this is not like it wasn't. Well, it wasn't nearly as tawdry as the book was, yeah, apparently. Yeah. But uh, that turned out brilliantly mm -hmm. because you know Nabokov signs off because it's his screenplay, and then Kubrick does his magic. I'm with just it. saying, imagine. Trying to recast that the way we just did Gatsby, and we're well, all yeah, that, so creeped out. Let's no, never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> like, do that. Yeah, like, like, who's the perfect 14-year-old girl for this? Um, <laughs> By the way, I found out my director, it's going to be Michelle Gondry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a weird nice, ass Gatsby. No, I think it would have a nice like aesthetic to it. Nice MC book. Escher's Gatsby. By the way, I am totally with you on the Gatsby book, and I'm, I know that I know that uh, that's unpopular. I know. Almost everybody loves Everybody it. loves Great Gatsby, but I hated it. Really? Uh, I mean, actually, no. I, I like it to a point. Uh, I just I feel like the whole, like, especially the um, when Myrtle runs out of her house to, to greet the car and yeah. everything. I feel like it's the dumbest thing ever. It's pretty dumb. It's pretty goddamn it's dumb. It's so dumb. And she's being held captive by yeah. George at that point. So why at that very moment is she able to like get out of the house and run into run in front of the car and all that? I, just ne I never understood that. And it's, it comes off really stupid in the movie, too. Um, Isla Fisher playing that. Playing oh, that yeah, role. that's right. Yeah. But uh, but uh, I remember there's a guy at the theater who was a really big F. Scott Fitzgerald fan. 
and I read the book just before the movie came out, reread it. And uh, I, I went to him. I was like, dude, I, that part is, <laughs> it, I can't get over it. And he said, well, F. Scott Fitzgerald believed that women were irrational people. And mm. that's what they would, that's what he believed women would do and everything. So it, it fits. I was like, okay. <laughs> it fits he, for him. It fits for F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> it doesn't fit for like 95% of society. How uh, do you write women? <laughs> I take a man. <laughs> and I, I think of a man. <laughs> <laughs> and I take away reason and accountability. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Oh, man. All right, baby. You want to move into a couple of questions here? Let's do it. Question. Question. I got something to say. I want the truth. I am listening. I love this one. Now that Quentin Tarantino is looking to direct a Star Trek film, sidebar, that became a reality like super fucking quick. It that really was did. like a rumor, and then all of a sudden, fuck, it's yeah, happening. We're writing oh. a script. Yeah. And um, I am on board oh mm-hmm. yeah fuck yeah man. don't you think this will be the the most successful star trek ever made well i think it will be simply because of the curiosity i think hollywood may even learn a lesson here yeah and think well what if we take this crazy like okay this is not unlike when we found out david fincher was going to direct world war z2 right because we haven't ever seen fincher delve into a genre film like a zombie apocalypse kind of mm. thing but i hope they'll do more of this and this question sort of hints at that. We're, we're about to take him to school here so uh now that quentin tarantino is looking to direct a star trek film who are some other auteur filmmakers that you would like to see direct a franchise movie mm. um i want Paul Thomas Anderson doing the next Planet of the Apes movie. Wow. 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 You think about what they set up in War of the Planet of the Apes. Caesar is no longer their leader. They have to set up a society. You know that in from looking at the Charlton Heston Planet of the Apes that they become religious fanatics. This is all up PTA's alley. I believe. Ah. I believe all of that is. I believe the way that this society grows and either evolves and devolves or whatever you want to call it is something that I think he could he could handle very well. And especially since the, the these three movies are all like, I mean, it's a great trilogy. It's one of the greatest trilogies mm-hmm. we've ever run into. Yep. Like all three movies are quality that doesn't ever happen. Right. So, you know, you can get somebody like PTA to come in and do that fourth one and, and treat that new society the way that I know he can. I think that would be a home run. That's nice. a very interesting idea. I like that. I, I would never have. Yeah. Uh, I would never have thought of that, but I think you're onto something there. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, my easy one is uh, Nolan doing Bond, but I'm far from the first guy to say that. It's just when you see what he was able to do with Batman, yeah. and when you see how often Bond ends up getting reinvented, what have you. You know, even the San, uh, Sam Mendes Bond movies are still super fucking ludicrous, and maybe oh, yeah. that's just part of Bond. But I wouldn't mind seeing, uh, you know, somebody with better ideas mm-hmm. like a uh, nolan who's going to have some kind of original spark um uh, but also that edge of realism yeah um so i'm far from the first person to say that the other one i wrote down that i think would be interesting is edgar wright doing a pixar film mm-hmm. i am 100 percent behind that because one. i think there's something about his style that would translate super well to animation yeah um and you know his sense of humor is very unique um and you know I don't know if Pixar is ever going to... I mean, they brought in Brad Bird, and he's kind of become part of the family, but their directors are almost always promoted from within. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I don't know if that's even viable. But I just like that idea. Once I thought of that, I was like, that's a really good union. Would he be allowed to be a little bit vulgar? I don't know. Maybe we go in this direction Chris talked about. If Disney's going to buy Fox, Mm -hmm. they're not going to take Deadpool down to a PG-13 rating because it would be studio suicide. Yeah, They can't. They right. would either stop making Deadpool movies or Disney's going to now be in the in the business of making R-rated films. Mm-hmm. And if they do that and have success there, um, that you may see them experiment with it more in some of their superhero properties. You may see them experiment with an adult Pixar movie that yeah. doesn't it doesn't have to be porn. You can just oh, yeah. <laughs> you could just it could just be a little bit you know, actiony with or vulgar or <laughs> you know even the Pixar films have occasional moments that if you're an adult. It, play raunchy but yeah. if you're 12 or under you don't even understand what's going on and it's not a stretch for edgar wright to do something that doesn't have 
any language in it or anything. I mean, this is what Wes Anderson did with Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, all the other Wes Anderson movies are, are, you know, I think most of them, if not all of them, are R-rated. There's some PG-13 mixed in, but uh, it's nothing that Edgar Wright wouldn't be able to do there is to take out some fucks. Yeah. And then, you know, and then and make it, you know, a, a comedy like he does. And I would love to see like some of the stuff he does in like actual regular movies get shot you know, like shot quote unquote and cut like that in a cartoon. Yeah. It would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a potential there. Yeah. What I'll you got? That. Would you keep Craig as Bond? I mean, no. I mean, at this point I've seen what he's gonna do. Mm-hmm. I don't need him there. He's I don't really even think he's a box office draw i think the people who yeah. go to see the next bond movie are not going because it's him mm-hmm. and you may even pull some more people in if you gave us a fresh face yeah whatever uh i'm gonna go with a die hard and i'm gonna have bong joon ho yeah direct it. um for several reasons <clears throat> first this is the guy that directed snowpiercer and Oakjaw, which mm-hmm. i haven't seen uh Oak-ja! yet Oak-ja or Oak-ja? Oak-ja! <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to fudge it in the middle so I don't say it too clear. Anyway, like the so, third line of Jailhouse Rock, where I always have to take a drink because I don't know it. What is the party <laughs> at the county jail? The prison band was there and they began to wail. Jailbird singing, let's rock. That's been my shtick for 20 years. I don't know the third line of that song. How often does that come up? <laughs> well, it's a gag. I, I used to do it at college at the. It was one of my recurring jokes at the cafeteria. I, don't, nice. I would just start singing it, and I would. Just, <laughs> anyway. Nice. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, what this guy has shown a knack for action for mm-hmm. sure, especially in Snowpiercer, and you could get back to that confined environment for John McClane. It doesn't even need to be John McClane. It could be a John McClane type. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that he's shown that he's he's been able to do is work outside of the traditional Hollywood system and still get big names. I mean, you got for Snowpiercer, he, he super international cast. Mm-hmm. You got Tilda Swinton, you got uh, Chris Evans, and then everybody else from everywhere. Mm-hmm. Billy Elliot. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think he could, you could put it in like a small village, even if it were outside the United States. I know that's not traditional diehard, mm-hmm. but if you put it in that kind of confined situation and shoot action the way that this guy knows how to shoot action, I think it could totally work. Mm-hmm. What if it was like... Um one of those, like, at least in terms of story, like one of those classic westerns where it's a small town that's being overrun by some kind of a criminal or yeah. an evil mayor or what have you. And then your McLean character, whether it's McLean or not, is like the only one that's going to stand up to him. Yeah. But you've got like a home alone kind of thing over a whole town of. Like, so basically three amigos. <laughs> yes. Can I have your watch when you are dead? <laughs> so, Grandma. So like the wind. <laughs> okay, I like this. What is the strangest third act of a movie that you've ever seen? Mm. This person recently watched The Neon Demon, and the last oh. 20 to 30 minutes are extremely strange. That is correct. That is one of the strange... <laughs> What's well, a strange movie in, in general? It's one of those Nicholas Winding Rever... Rever- <laughs> well, we're fudging a lot however, of names. <laughs> however that name's pronounced that I've never heard before, but... It's probably... Like the F is silent. Yeah, it it's, like Ren. Is, it's Ren. It's probably Ren. <laughs> Makes sense. But uh, but yeah, that movie is like it's strange in general. And then the third act is like, God <laughs> damn it. Um, the bar none. The the strangest third act I've ever seen is Tusk. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> it starts off so normally. Yeah, there's some interludes in there where Johnny Depp's got playing that weird fucking inspector uh character and everything and he's going around like asking where this guy could be and everything it's not nearly as weird as what of course happens where justin long is a fucking one is johnny Depp playing the same character that he plays in yoga hoses yes Yes. okay yes uh and i believe he's supposed to play him again in that noose job yeah um but uh but yeah like uh it it's it like I've, I've said this before about tusk it's like it's really good like there's actually like awesome dialogue and like a, you know, like when justin long and uh and the actor i can't think of right now are talking uh, by the fireplace and everything it's like you're just you're just wrapped into this mm-hmm. it's so good and then like yeah he turns into a fucking wall <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah and it's just <laughs> it's it's just it's it fulfills the it fulfills the uh you know the requirements of a movie made out of a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um I'll shout out Pineapple Express because the last third of that movie is just bonkers. It is. Anything leading up to it. But I've talked about that before. So I'm going to go with WALL-E, which is a movie that I really yeah. like. But at about the two-thirds mark, it just shifts into full madcap comedy Butterfingers <laughs> trying to chase the MacGuffin mm-hmm. through the ship yeah. to get to the thing. And it's not something that brings the movie down. I don't think the question asker was even saying that derails a film. It's just, what's the strangest third act? You watch the first, especially the first 20 minutes of Wally. There's no way you would ever predict the last 20 minutes. No. Based no. on the first 20, because it's uh, everything about it changes from being this atmospheric think piece with some charm to just, it kind of just becomes a Bugs Bunny cartoon there at the end. Yeah. Or Tom and Jerry running across the screen over and over and over again. It's just a meaningless action to... Prolong the MacGuffin Huey. Anyway, <laughs> MacGuffin. I like that movie. I love that movie. It's yeah. one of it's one of their better ones. But the third, the last third, is nothing like the first two thirds. Yeah. it's just really weird. I am going to avoid my pick being 2001: A Space Odyssey because I've talked so much about Stanley Kubrick already. It, it, a, it would be a good pick. A though. good, uh, good third act pick though. It's uh, it talk about going off the rails. I mean, from where it finally gets to a narrative structure of. HAL 9000 and defeating him essentially, getting off the ship and everything. And now we've gone into to crazy town yeah. through the space portal and into the, the time shifting into the space baby. But <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, I l- fucking love that movie. Anyway, but uh, I, I have to have my pick be the frogs in Magnolia. Ah. Uh, because fucking frogs. Yeah. <laughs> What is the meaning of the frogs? I still don't even know what the meaning of the well, frogs there's not, is. There's, that's the problem I have with it, is that it is weird for the sake of being weird and chosen to have some hollow plagues, biblical, like because these people are all in some of the darkest hours of their lives, right. what have you, and now a plague of frogs. Now, I don't know if he's saying... Well, at least it's not raining blood after this. Or, you know, I mean, <laughs> things could be better. It could be raining frogs. I think he just wanted to give the characters a shared experience that was um, paranormal or abnormal. Yeah. Uh, and and I've always been puzzled by why he decided to go that because the movie doesn't give a shit about explaining any of it. Right, right, right. They yeah. all acknowledge it, uh, but no, but nobody ever. Is, nobody's like. Well, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, there, exactly. Was there a shipment of frogs <laughs> flying overhead? The, like, the the whole yeah. I mean, I and I, I I agree with you that the the direction of that is uh, is weird. Um, the whole theme of the movie is that these strange type of things happen all the time. All these coincidences happen all the time. All that. The the frog rain is something that has apparently happened before, and it's you and nobody really knows the reason hmm. why. It's it's it could be like the lakes dried up or something, and you know, the, and there's tadpoles. Who fucking knows? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but apparently that's happened before. Like that's a thing. Uh, maybe that. I mean, but it's not something that happens all the time right. or anything like that. Again, part of the theme of the movie is that it's stuff that doesn't happen all the time, but can happen. These strange coincidences, so on and so forth. Um, now, whether or not you agree with the choice of having frogs falling out of the sky and everything is another separate argument. It uh, is. A, it is a weird. I, I actually like it. I'm perfectly fine with it, mm-hmm. but it's definitely uh, jarring from a very humanistic story, mm-hmm. a very personal story, a very uh, emotional story. And I think it probably needed something like that, something completely bonkers to snap because it does snap a lot of them kind of into a realization but it is peculiar uh now just looking this up as on the internet just uh, the first thing that comes up and i'm not saying it's right or wrong so don't take this as like this is what chris atkinson said (laughs) as total fact but what comes up is raining animals is a rare meteorological phenomenon in which flightless animals fall from the sky such occurrences have been reported in many countries throughout history one hypothesis is that tornadic water spouts sometimes pick up creatures such as fish or frogs and carry them up to several miles. Ah. And um, and so, yeah, there's even a part in there where, like, you know, the frogs are falling and the and 
Paul Thomas Anderson sort of zooms in on that picture and it says, but it did happen. Yeah. And, or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. that type of thing. Um, so yeah, there's two things going on. You know, one is, you know, uh, can that possibly happen? Well, yes, it can. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, do I agree with the choice? That's up to you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. I do not. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it for this week. Uh, keep going to uh, the Sincast presented by Cinema Sin's Facebook page, SoundCloud, Twitter, Reddit, email, all Everywhere. these things. Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> um, to uh, comment on this episode, if you so choose. Um, uh, that'll do it for this week. It's Chris Agnes and Jeremy Scott and Barrett Share. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube. Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit cinemasends.com. You know, there's so many fucking outtakes for music video sends that I think of after the fact. Oh, yeah. It's so annoying. Like the, the Ed Sheeran Perfect song. Yeah. It's got that doom, 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 doom. And every time my brain goes to the beginning of he works hard every day of my life. <laughs> At the end of the day. <coughs> and then the uh, the new Katy Perry one is just like, hey, 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 da, 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 which is fucking Uptown Girl. Yes. That I should have totally put in there. I, there's still time to do that one. I made the Yes, Uptown Girls. I remember that song. Back mm-hmm. when Billy Joel was popular with teenagers. And he was, <laughs> and he was married to Christy Brinkley. Yeah, yeah. He was. And but she's the, well, in that video, Uptown Girls. Yeah, that's right. I bet you he could still pack out a tour, but it would be all people 40 and older. Oh, yeah, because he played Wrigley uh, when we were up there. And it, I don't know. It, it killed. I think he is still popular with like younger people really yeah i don't think it's like going to a fog hat concert or something (laughs) (laughs) thin lizzie yeah thin lizzie (laughs) jethro tall jethro tall i almost went to see jethro tall there's like a fontanelle type of place up in chicago called ravinia Mm -hmm. and uh this professor of pharmacology, this British guy, <laughs> like the day before, he's leaving the office. He's like, would you like to come to see Jethro Tull with me tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, I actually would, but I can't do that. <laughs> what a fucking weird request. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, that I love pretty... the flute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. What was the uh, fog hat hit? Was it Slow Rod? It wasn't. Mm. I don't even know. See, now I have Who to look them up. Who did Slow Ride? I don't think they did Slow Ride. Well, maybe they did. <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> Slow down. I fucking hate that song. Oh, hey, they did do that. They did do that song. <laughs> Good pull. <laughs> that was, that's definitely their big hit. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Fog Hat record, actually. I had the, uh, the record with... Uh, like a record? Like a record record? Yeah, like a record record record. record? I got that, and I got Three Dog Night, uh, which was one of my favorite vinyls ever. Three Dog Night is some good shit. It really is. Especially if you have, like, party favors. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Open up a window, sucker. Let me catch my breath. Is this going to be our first pod of the new year? Yeah. I saw something on Reddit. No, it's Twitter or Reddit. It was Twitter. Somebody said, my dad just told me that on New Year's Eve, every adult will have been born in the 20th century, and every kid will have been born in the 21st century, and it's the only day that you can say that. Interesting. Got to wrap my brain around that. Just to that 18-year 18 18 yeah. Year mark. Yeah. So if you're younger than 18, you definitely are born in the 21st century. If you're older, you were definitely born in the 20th. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good to know. Mm. It's not really all that mind blowing, <laughs> but it's one of those things that one, once you once you first hear it, you're like, whoa. And then like an hour later, you're like, well, that's not all that cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's math. just math. <laughs>
I saw this story. It was pretty neat about a guy who was admittedly depressed about something, death in the family or something, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> watched, binge watched some show with like 12 seasons on Netflix constantly for like two days or more mm -hmm. without stopping. And Netflix noticed and sent him an email to check on him and make sure he was okay. That's weird because hmm. they've done some weird analytic shit lately. Like, have you seen all these articles about like who is binge watching The Christmas Prince or something like that? Like, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Like, no. somebody, there's like two people in the world that have watched The Christmas Prince, which is like a made for TV movie, like 11 times. Oh, yeah. And they're like, wow. what the? I think they did the same thing. They sent an email like, What's what's your deal? <laughs> <laughs> what I don't understand is why Netflix doesn't give out their numbers for mm -hmm. like w the shows. It's not like they have advertisers that they have to worry about. Mm -hmm. They they pay you know gobs of money to get these series, and they play them regardless of whether they're good or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I never understood why they just can't be like, okay, House of Cards did this. And Stranger Things does this. I think mm. it's probably just still market positioning. Like, let's say nowhere near as many people are watching the original shows and movies as we think. Mm -hmm. And they announce these numbers and they're way low. Mm -hmm. Well, then the next David Fincher big actor pairing show that is shopping around town might be more likely to go to HBO or Amazon. But you don't think David Fincher knows what House of Cards is doing, though? Well, that's a good point. I'm sure he does. I, that's the only thing. Yeah, that I'm sure I, internally they, they, they know. You would have to, you'd have to think they'd know. But, but maybe an incoming, like if they were somehow, let's just say Nolan gets together with Christian Bale and comes up with this awesome TV show concept and they're out there pitching it to stars and HBO and Amazon and Hulu and Netflix. You know, I don't think we know numbers on any of the, these online platforms. We don't, but they're getting money anyway. Mm-hmm. They don't. They're they're not releasing them because they don't have to. I think. But Netflix is also still like burning through cash. Like yeah. they still have investors, right? And I'm sure the investors know the numbers. It's uh, it's just an odd thing to me. I, I just I don't understand what they gain from it. It feels like you gain more by saying, you know, 1.5 million people saw Stranger Things, and then you know. And it's probably more than that, obviously. I right. mean, Stranger Things is such a phenomenon that um, the I was watching uh, Molly's Game the other day, and just one actor from Stranger Things showed up on the screen, and I heard gasps. Huh. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Huh. And I was like, Jesus. That, huh. That's when you know a show is huge. Who was the character? It was the the guy who plays the the boyfriend but not the boyfriend anymore oh yeah the, yeah the, the girl i don't know what his name is yeah i like that character though yeah i do too mm -hmm. he was way better in the second season mm -hmm. first season he's kind of a dick but like you could see there's like a little bit of extra layer to him yeah in the second season they really let him shine and that how'd you like molly's game really enjoyed it yeah that's getting really good reviews when uh when aaron asked for his top five i put it in there Nice. Now I haven't seen everything either. I think I think the top five I gave Aaron is bullshit. It's what it is now, mm. but it may not be that. I way. gave him the same reply. I was like, "Well, here's the top five of what I've seen, <laughs> but there's probably twenty I haven't seen that are better." Right? Like I have a feeling at this point, whenever I see Wind River, which should be arriving at my house today, um, it's going to be in my top five. Mm. But I haven't seen it, so yeah. my top five is largely shit like like three superhero movies in there mm -hmm. logan wonder woman and spider-man homecoming are all in there and then dunkirk get out know. get out yeah yeah i had oh. get out and I, I would have a very similar one i'd get out at, at my top and i had dunkirk up there i had wonder woman in the top five it's crazy to think of get out like that was a february march release? february february and we were talking about like man that may end mm. up being my favorite movie of the well year. yeah when you looked at what was coming out it was pretty clear that it was going to be up there it was going mm -hmm. to be well and if we're not alone either several like of these critics associations and whatnot and even just critics listing their top 10 have put it up like number one mm -hmm. it was not boston some big cities like critics association voted get out number one man i it's so weird because the beginning of that movie really bothered me the music did because mm -hmm. you had the music that was playing in the dude's car and then it switched to the voices when they're like going down the road and everything and then it switches to Childish Gambino's Redbone. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, that's too much <laughs> at the beginning. You know, it's too much like awesome because all of them are awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then that fucking Redbone song, so fucking good, mm-hmm. man. God, that's my favorite song of the year, by the way. It's almost annoying to me how much talent Donald Glover has. Mm-hmm. He shouldn't. <laughs> it's like you Justin Timberlake, right? Just yeah. spread it around. Soon. Honestly, <laughs> what's more annoying is that he's not bigger than he is. I know. I, yeah, that's I, that's maybe the too. most annoying thing. Let's see, yeah. he's yet to go mainstream, but I think the industry has already recognized and lauded him for I mean, both music and that Atlanta show at the, at the yeah, very least. He has, I mean, he's got all the critical plaudits for sure. He's got, you know, being on Community made him that kind of, uh, you know, cult sort of, you know, actor. And then Atlanta gave him the critical darling stuff. His music's kind of had mixed reviews over the years. He's mm. had like five or six albums. Yeah, he's got a lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, like this new one that he came out with, Red Roan on it and everything. Mm-hmm. That was a one that a lot of people were like, some critics were like, love how different this is. Some others were like, I hate how different this yeah. is. Yeah. And, uh, it's like The Last Jedi. Yeah, exactly. But he can fucking sing now. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, you're a rapper, you're a comedian, you're an actor. That's awesome. Like, you're really good at all those. Now you can fucking sing. Sounds mm-hmm. like fucking D'Angelo on there. Mm-hmm. God. By the way, my brother texted me this morning and said uh, he'd just seen The Last Jedi and listened to our mini pond. Mm-hmm. Um, keep in mind, he and I disagree more often than not. Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't like La La Land at all. Doesn't like Lord of the Rings. One day we'll bring him on, have him argue with me about it. But he said, I agree with you about The Last Jedi, and Barrett lost some of my respect. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I'm sure that happened. I mean, I think a lot of people that, that agree with me probably lost some respect. I mean, I'm too. sure he's joking in yeah. the sense that, you know, he never met you. And, you know, the only kind of respect he can have for you is your movie opinions. <laughs> and he disagreed with you on this one. But, I mean, he still probably has more respect for you than me in terms of movie opinions because <laughs> we disagree so often. I, I just I thought it. you'd appreciate that. Yes. Because you liked that a little too much for him, I think. I know. Hey, I love what I love. Mm-hmm. He didn't say anything about Chris, so I guess you're still in good standing. I guess. Um, I don't know. Well, I mm. think we all agree that there's issues and that there's some good stuff yeah no i I think we all said that too Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. it looks like a movie that is a bit conflicted a bit just Mm -hmm. a bit Mm -hmm. just a bit Let's have Ryan Johnson on the on the show. And you know what? This out. Ryan Johnson is the reason why there was a Twitter ever created exactly. for Cinema Sentence. Yeah, that's a that's a. And he will never come on. Our show. <laughs> yeah, he not, will never. Not a ever. big fan. Be- the, the 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 reason why the Twitter was created was because he wasn't a very big fan. <laughs> right? <laughs> Didn't he? Did he respond to that that tweet? Yeah, uh, yeah, he responded. Um, because I said we're just assholes, and he and I created this Twitter just to let you know mm-hmm. we're just fucking around, and he was like, oh, all right, well, no big deal. But then like. Later on, he tweeted a couple more times about not really liking it. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to try and change your mind. And that's, a, that's an odd, I mean, that's something that we've experienced a few times, too. Like, somebody here is like, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm down with it. And then, like, five minutes later, they're like, I'm not down with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>